Three minutes after 10 is the time, and I have two screens rolling in front of me um, with, with rolling news stations, one of which is currently featuring an address from a senior member of the Israeli Defense Force, and the other of which features footage of a child being dug out of rubble in Gaza while other residents continue searching and, and digging for bodies in a building where they were where they were sheltering. Um, it's a child's body being dug out of the rubble, and it's a, it's a fairly um, bleak juxtaposition, isn't it? Let's try and use the word bleak a bit less often. I, 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 I don't know why I said that, actually, but it just occurred to me then as the words came out of my mouth again. So there, there are two, two screens uh, literally in front of me displaying the two elements of the current chapter of this unfolding tragedy, this unfolding disaster. Um, there are some provocative questions I could ask you today. Uh, what, 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 is, what, is th th that, what, what is this bombing going to achieve? Now we're seeing the numbers of Palestinian dead doubling roughly what uh, the, the murdered Israelis last weekend. What, what is the plan? What is going to be achieved? But I don't think it's the day to ask that. Is there a uh, <clears throat> hierarchy in place? I note that the BBC has received roughly 50-50 complaints. I bet it's 52-48. They've received roughly 50-50 complaints about bias, which I suspect that senior staff members at the BBC will, will take some comfort from. Um, uh, I'm not a great believer that if you get equal accusations of bias from both sides, it proves that you're being impartial. I think it's often more complicated than that. But in this particular case, following uh, social media criticisms, I, I, I think probably you could break it down. Half, half of people heavily invested in this think that um, media, BBC is heavily biased in one direction and half think it's heavily biased in the other direction. Here at LBC, we're a little bit different, I suppose. On most issues, we're allowed to um, pick a side. We sort of balance each other out in the course of the day, but I even find the language of picking a side unbearable in this context. And we spoke a lot last week about how upsetting even that is for some people. They see it as a, as a sort of imposition of equivalence or a, or a, um, a pursuit of balance where there is none. But I, I said to you yesterday, and I'll say it again to you today, I am not going to change my reaction to news of a dead child according to that child's um, origins, antecedents, geographical location, ethnicity, star sign, or, and here it is, or religion. So two calls yesterday struck me. No, I don't want to offend anybody. I don't know that they were the best calls to the program, but they, they were the ones that sowed seeds that sprouted after the program. And one was a caller suggesting that, as with the Troubles in Ireland, this hasn't really got much to do with religion now. I mean, they may have had religion at its root, but it doesn't seem to play much of a part today. I don't know whether that's true or not. Um, and the other was... I think it was Mark in Chichester, actually, who very, very early in his call described himself as I'm Jewish but not religious. And, I, and I've said to him, so you heard me say this, if you were listening. If you weren't, I need a letter off your mum by the end of morning break, okay? Um, I said to him that, that that always jars me. It didn't necessarily used to, but in the, all the years I've been doing this job and all the lessons I've learned, that's one of the phrases that, that I respond to, I think, very differently from how I used to. Because you might say, I'm not a religious Jew. I'm not religious. I'm not, a Jew. I'm not very religious. I'm Jewish, but I'm not very religious. But it wouldn't have made any difference to the Nazis, would it? So in the context of persecution, division, Holocaust, you kind of can't leave religion out of it. Because it was religion matrilineal religion that essentially identified the targets of the Nazis. And yet, in this debate, imagine if you were a complete outsider trying to work out why the people living in the Gaza Strip and the people living in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv couldn't all be living in peace, could be living in a, 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 two countries with normal borders. And you're trying to work out why, why they can't. What, what is the answer to that question? Historical grievance, injustice, imposition, colonialism, or uh, biblical birthright? There are so many different answers. But how, 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 important, um, how important is religion? What role does religion play in the current situation? I, I'm not sure I can answer that question. I'm not sure I know. Because if, it, if it's nothing to do with religion, 
as one very well-informed caller said yesterday, if it's nothing to do with religion, then what is it to do with? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three is the number that you need. Um, the question is, is is pretty straightforward. I'm pretty sure that when I first started very clumsily and often I think quite offensively discussing Middle Eastern issues and discussing Israel in particular, I had an abiding fascination with the with the notion of a of of, of religious superiority of, of of a kind of chosen people ideology, and I used to think that that was a a really big part of the problem, that if you subscribe to a a chosen by God, uh, a God that other people don't necessarily believe in or believe in a a slightly different version of, then you have problems that can never be overcome. There's a sort of intractability built in there that is, I I mean, it's it's, it's almost the definition, isn't it, of of an unravelable knot. How does that ever end? And, And I don't think that's true. And yet we talk about Islamist terror we we know that the um ideology such as it is of, of hamas and even i think of of hezbollah is well we we use the word islamist for a reason don't we and and is it just a distinction between muslim and jew and there will be a massive majority of muslims as ever who abhor things done in the name of their religion by terrorists and by um monsters and similarly there are there are plenty of people who practice peaceful religion and don't subscribe to the idea that by dint of being of one faith or another they're inherently and naturally superior to another faith so i don't even know today what role religion plays in in these problems in these unfolding issues and i mean how how how, how important is it? That's, that's, it's not like me, is it? I've only got like three, four word question. I don't think I've got much else to to pontificate on or contemplate. I, I, well, I, why isn't it featuring more, actually, is the question, isn't it? More than, than how important is it? Why, why isn't religion featuring more in this conversation, given that the the territorial decisions were defined by it, but we don't we don't hear any reference to it in the context of uh, the conversation that we're currently having if you hit the numbers now you will get through i don't want a, a, a rouse today I, I the first caller yesterday was quite um uh, punchy and and uh, we took one the first caller of one show last week just went off on a completely mad tangent about me so we we, we cut that one off quite early i'm not i don't i, I mean it pr- pr- probably won't work but i'll say it anyway i don't think i want any rails today Everyone's got a limit. I've told you a few times, I'm not one of those presenters that can sort of turn off my emotions. I, I, I can't just treat it all like a game and, and, and treat a conversation about children dying on both sides of a man-made wall in the middle of the Middle East. I can't turn it into a, an opportunity to attack the BBC or just have a conversation as if it was Labour versus Tory or, I don't know, a Just Stop Oil protest. I can't. I can't. This gets to me. It kills me. It breaks me up inside. You can, you know it does because it does you as well. So I have it. There's a limit. <clears throat> there's a finite amount of tension that I can tolerate. And, and I, 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 some days I can wade into the fray and I'll take uh, criticism and abuse from all comers and, and other days I just don't really want to do it. And today I don't really want to do it. Today I want the lights to come on a bit more. And, and they may not, what they illuminate may not be pretty. We may not like what is illuminated today. But if you were to ask somebody a sort of fairly cursory question about what is going on, um, you would expect religion to be a large part of the answer so why has it been such a tiny part of the conversation that we have been hearing and having for the last 10 days or so uh, that number once again 03456060973 is the number you need it's 13 minutes after 10 i think we will find time today to talk about other things as well i'm intrigued really intrigued and it's lasted for 48 hours now, this intrigue. So uh, you, you can tell that it's real. By the uh, news coming from our prisons, uh, the latest, of course, is that violent prisoners could be freed um, to ease pressure on jails. That, that is one of the maddest headlines you're ever going to see in your life. Violent convicts may be freed this week to ease pressure on jails. 
Alex Chalk gave a speech yesterday which um, uh, laid out some plans for the future which look a lot like some plans for the past that got kind of overridden or or ignored. But I, the uselessness of short prison sentences really intrigues me. If you've ever served a short prison sentence, then today could be your day to break your phone in duck. But we'll start, as I think we must, with, with this question. Whenever I came to topics like this as a kid, as a, as a you know, wet behind the ears radio host, I always thought that they were conversations about religion. And they're not, or, or certainly this one doesn't seem to be and hasn't been and doesn't seem destined to be. So I think today we will try to work out why that might be. 0345 973 10.17, not for the first time in the last 10 days or so. I, I find myself r- r- looking at something that's appeared on in front of me and thinking I, perhaps I've accidentally taken some magic mushrooms or something. It seems, I think, that an MP of Palestinian heritage, the first British Palestinian MP, in fact, Leila Moran, I think she's just been asked on breakfast television whether, given her family connections, she knew anything in advance about the Hamas attack on Israel. I I wonder if if you don't know already, I wonder if you can guess who the presenter was asking that question. That is certainly how it's been presented to me. I need perhaps to play the footage. Shall we discover together whether... That is, I mean, that would be like asking me if I had any inside information on the, I don't know, the, the, the Canary Wharf attack by the IRA when I was at college. So absolutely breathtaking. But, I, I, and, you know, conversations about hierarchies and biases and balance do perhaps um, lead us to conclude that he's probably not going to get into any trouble at all for that. 18 after 10 is the time. Z is in Birmingham to tell us why religion is not being talked about at all this week, and, and whether indeed it should be. Uh, Z, what would you like to say? First of all, James, I just want to say um, thank you for being one of the only people on the media who's neutral on this whole um, on this whole issue. I'll be honest with you, I've been watching you for over a long time, mate. I'm talking over a year. I listen to you all the time. Thank you. And I have so much respect for you, and I really genuinely, that comes from the heart. Oh, that, you that, say that, that Palestinian children and Israeli children are the same, because they are. They are the same. So um, I just want to say thank you for that. Thank you. With regards to religion, with regards to religion, I can only speak from an Islamic point of view because I'm a Muslim. And I can tell you the words of the Quran. You know, they say that if you were to kill one death, it is as if you've killed the whole of humanity. And that is God's words in, in our Quran. So therefore, from an Islamic point of view, from a religious point of view, from the Muslim side, from the Palestinian side, I cannot justify any killing of anybody so for what happened last week on saturday in israel islam teaches us not to do those actions so from a religious point of view that's the answer from that side i can't speak on the israeli side but i'm sure in judaism it's the same thing if not similar you make a a powerful point and and of course you do and i and i understand it completely but it's not it's not the beginning and the end of the conversation that we're going to have today because no, because because I mean people not. may not even know that that I, I think Hamas translates as Islamic resistance movement doesn't it so clearly from their point of view religion is quite a big part of I think I think from their point of view from you trying to understand it from their point of view is if you look at what's been happening in the last 70 years and obviously I'm only 30 so I can only speak of what I've been seeing <laughs> yes. you know from a teenager do you of know course, what I mean all I do, across yes. social media and prior to this um, this atrocity that happened this week, prior to this, I have constantly seen um, Israeli IDF soldiers and um, Israeli settlers going into Gaza, going into the West Bank and humiliating people, attacking people, literally grabbing elderly, throwing them onto the floor, doing whatever they want. And there's even people that come from the UK that go to um, Jerusalem, you know, because it's part of the pilgrimage as well to go and see these holy sites. And if they're not in a group, and sometimes even when they are in a group, they are also tormented by the idea if their passports get taken off them, they get interrogated, and the way that they're treated, it's just not acceptable. But you know what? They get away with it, James. They've gotten away with this for such a long time. And I think the Palestinian people have been so, so patient. And Hamas did ask for a two-state solution in the past. I'm sure that was something that was brought to the table. But 
it just hasn't happened. And again, I am not justifying any killing. I, I don't know that the last side. bit. I don't know that the last bit is true. And and uh, yeah, I mean, you are. Uh, I'm, I'm sure unintentionally. But when you talk about the patience of Palestinians, it sounds as if it sounds as if you're casting the terror attacks as, as being no. a consequence of patience no, running no, no. out. And well, I'm glad that, I'm glad no, we've clarified that. Yeah, but I don't. I don't. I think no Hamas are Hamas are an yeah, obstacle no to a two, Hamas in their current form are an obstacle to a two state solution. But but if the, it's not about just is, no, hang on, because yeah. I. I I, I, I want to get get back to the focus of today's show. So, mm-hmm, if it's mm-hmm. not about religion, it's not about religion. What is it? A, pol- what is politics. it about? It's just. Um, it's just. Unfortunately, there's a very skewed narrative that the media is showing, and I think, to be honest with you, they're trying to make any justification as means necessary to, to destroy Gaza. That's okay, what, again, that's, that's not think. that's not the phone in that we're having today. But I know, I, but, but I'm I, just answering your question. I, I hear, I hear you. I don't think okay. if religion was involved, I think this wouldn't be happening. And yet, how do we distinguish between the people in Gaza and the people in Israel, if not at some point by religion? Uh, I, I don't know how religious these. Um, no, these no, 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 no. It's not a question of religiousness <laughs> or religiosity. It's a question of religion. What what is the distinguishing feature of these two Semitic peoples, if not religion? And yet, I agree with you that it doesn't sound as if religion has anything to do, or certainly not your religion as you understand it, has nothing to do with what anybody has done. And yet, and yet, for the people firing the bullets or dropping the bombs, I I I, I don't know if the same would be true. See, thank you, and and thank you for your kind words at the beginning as well. David is in Kingston. David, what would you like to say? I would say it's colonisation. This was a land that was promised from a British a British politician to a wealthy banker, German banker, before before World War Two happened, and they taken they displaced seven hundred thousand people. And these people in Gaza are the, are the descendants of the people that that, that the British government dis, displaced. That's colonisation. Um, they may have used religion as an excuse to colonise. Well, it wasn't an ex- had- it wasn't an excuse to colonise, was it? It was a it was a homeland for the Jewish people, and and, and your history is correct. Although we, we'll never know whether the 1948 settlement would have happened if the Holocaust hadn't. And and I'd ask you a question, Daniel Finkelstein asked in his Times column last week when um, uh, some Jews were liberated from a concentration camp by a Russian soldier, a Russian Jewish soldier, and they said, "Where do we go now?" Well, when was it a Jewish state? You're going back to Roman times. No, no, where, but the question is, where do we go now? Uh, the, you're talking about the displacement of 700,000 people that had lived there for, for, for no, hundreds of No, I'm not. I'm just talking years. about the Jewish people being liberated from a concentration camp. And, and, and most of modern Israel was um, nothing like what it is now in 1948. The country as it exists now has been built from the ground up. But the question I'm asking you is, where, where would they go? Well, this, this, you can, and I'm you going to insist that you on. answer it, or, 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 or we'll move on to another caller. Where would they go? If you if you if you make, if you put them into someone else's house, in, in no, nope, it's not they an answer. Where would house. they go? Well, not somewhere where they, they no, have. No, not not, not where won't they go, David? It's a simple question. Where would those people go? If it's, okay, if it's down to the British government, no, nope, it's down to you. It's down okay, to you, in mate. The U- in the in the UK, if it's down to the British government, they're going to displace. This place, Where would they go? In the, U- the UK. Can you hear me? The UK. Okay. So we'd have brought all the Jewish people in the world to the United Kingdom. Rather than if you're rather than displace other people, if you're going to take that, how would liberty, you do that without displacing other people? Well, give it to some of the land. That, Where are they the, going to live? To the royal, you know, when the when King William the first came over again, colonising this land, yeah. one third of this country belongs belongs to yeah. to his friends and okay. family. I, I'm glad I'm glad you reached for William the Conqueror because I, I was worried that people wouldn't realise how ridiculous you sounded. Well, you, you so you support what? what no, it's not about what I support. I just asked. I just asked where those people would go, this, and this you started talking about. And you started talking about William the Conqueror, which unintentionally helps everybody understand why that's such a powerful, and largely unanswerable question. Twenty six minutes after ten is the time, uh, and for you, of course, it is about religion because two Semitic peoples living alongside is is the uh, unachievable dream the difference the distinction is that you don't believe the jews had the right to be there but you do believe that the palestinians did and then you know that's a politically sustainable position but it's a much uglier one than perhaps you realize in many ways leslie's in boreham wood leslie what would you like to say 
I would just like to ask you, uh, James, that if well, hang religion... On, you, it's a, I know it's a bit unfair, given that you haven't got a radio show, but you're here to answer the questions I've asked, I'm asking. OK, fine. <laughs> I'd just like to ask you, if religion... <laughs> no, I'll, I'll say it again. I'm asking why asking, no one's talking I'm, I'm about to... religion. So your answer to that question is... If religion is out of the picture, that's the question. Why, when I walk down, why, when I walk down the street, am I shouted? I'm a, I'm a religious Jew. I'm not Israeli. I'm a born and Brit, born and bred Brit. And why am I shouted at? Free, free Palestine. Well, that's about religion. <laughs> well, right. That's that's exactly. about your religion. But but the situation as it is unfolding in Palestine today, the bombing of Gaza. What does that have to do with religion? Nothing. Pardon. Absolutely nothing. But so when I'm you get believe- abused on the streets of London, that's all about religion. And when Muslims get bombed in their homes, that's got nothing to do with religion. Well, to kill every Jew. So obviously it's to do with religion. But, but, but we're talking about the bombings in Gaza today. How has that got nothing to do with religion? Because there, there's Christians. I mean, if, as far as I'm well, concerned... That's a religion. There's whoever living... Okay. All right, you're you're clearly not interested in having a conversation. I'm very interested in having a conversation, but I'm I'm just interested in having answers to the questions that I'm asking. So, by the way, I feel terrible about what's happening to you, and I completely abhor the abuse that you're receiving. But but when you say that the response from Israel to Gaza has absolutely nothing to do with religion, I I don't see I don't see how you can I don't see how you can knit the two together. One's got everything to do with religion, but the response has got nothing to do with religion. I've got no idea. No, I've got no idea. Well, nor have I. I'm connected through my religion. Nor Correct. have I. I've got no idea. No. And that's what's confusing, isn't it? So, what role is religion playing in today's clearly, event? It's not a great phone line, actually, Leslie. Clearly, me walking down the street, the people who are shouting at it uh, at me, they believe it's religion related. Israelis who are trying to defend their citizens, and that's a conflation of that's a, consla- a conflation of Israeli with Jew. Correct. Yes, but that's not conflation of. And I'm so it's, with Muslim. I, it's very frustrating because I can't continue the conversation with the phone line only giving me about one word in three. But then we come to the next question, which is um, why, why are those people in Gaza being bombed today? And the answer would have to be because of what Hamas did in the name of religion, <laughs> in the name of their religion, or what they believe to be their religion. Um, I, I, Leslie, it was an unsatisfactory conversation because of the quality of the phone line, so I, I apologise for that. It's coming up to half past ten. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC, and Thomas Watts is here now with your headlines. 33 minutes after 10 is the time. Um, I, on reflection, as some of you did point out that at the outset, including my friend Scott, that... Um, Suggesting I'm not really in the mood for a fight, so we're going to talk about religion. May, may not have been one of my wisest contributions to public discourse. Well, let's just call it. Let's just call it optimistic, shall we? Um, uh, and uh, uh, David's Jewishness being conflated with support for, I don't know. Uh, let's just say Israeli foreign policy or Israeli domestic policy. And um, it seems to me to be the. Uh, opposite or the um, corollary was the word I was looking for of what happened to Leila Moran on the television this morning because this is absolutely extraordinary. Leila Moran is a British Palestinian woman who became the first British Palestinian member of parliament and Richard Maidley was presenting a breakfast television program this morning and I, 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 I can't I can't believe my ears. They have more and more people coming to the church because you seek sanctuary in a church that's that's what you do. And, you know, to the why don't they just move? Because I'm thinking to myself, why, when you know that something's coming, why don't you move? Mm. And then to hear, well, actually, they have nowhere to go to. And Mm. remember, there's no way to communicate with other people in in Southern Gaza. So what are you meant to do? You haven't got a car. There's no, there's no phone battery. Mm. So you can't get in a car. They're too frail anyway, one of them. Um, And they're there as, as a family unit. So I'm hearing what's happening from them through. Uh, one of the sisters who is the cousin of my mother. So my, my immediate family is in the West Bank. They're in Jerusalem, Ramallah and, and Jericho. Thank goodness so far they are very scared about what comes next and they're fine. But this extent, this 
pocket of the extended family we are desperately, desperately worried Gaza about. Needs to stop your now. family connections uh, in Gaza, uh, did, did you have any indication of what was going to happen uh, 10 days ago, two weeks ago? Was there any, any word on the street? In Not. I, I suppose you could make a case for him just being a bit thick and thinking that, you know, terror attacks are launched after a bit of banter with the lads and a bit of chatter down down at the uh, down at the town square. What are you doing tomorrow? Oh, I'm going to launch a terror attack on it. But good God, what I mean, the, the mind boggles, actually. The mind boggles. And it, for me, continues to boggle at the, at the precise role that religion plays in the combat in the Middle East at the moment, in the, in the bob. So for Hamas, their rationale has to be religious. They, they exist to, um, uh, I, I, well, it's called the Islamic resistance movement is how it translates. And yet, and yet the question of why are Palestinian people being bombed in Gaza today, is that because of their religion? John's in Newham. John, what would you like to say? Really? Yes. Um, yes. Hello. Hello. I'm, I'm delighted. I'm delighted that you're introducing religion into it because it's a very key part of the equation is it, and is overlooked. Yes. Um, yes. And the reason I'm saying that is um, in biblical times, in the Old Testament um, and the New Testament, that the, the, the people created with Jews and the he, Hebrews and known as Jews, they, they were given the first prophecy. So they're they're not. Um, special people but god chose them as to be an example of the world and well, but we, obviously the huge majority of people in the world would would completely reject that well it's in the bible put it that way it's, 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 I, I know it's, and obviously the yeah. huge majority of people in the world would completely reject that you're right but for those who do believe but yes you're you are you're god, you're, you're you're describing the, the psyche of the believers as it were the, the, the believers yes. and, and and as a believer i'm, I'm a Jewish descent on my mother's side, Chris on my father's side, and I love both, but I follow uh, sure. Judaism because right. I prefer it. Um, uh, but I believe that these prophecies cannot be overridden by man. And because it, um, <laughs> it says that the Jews will be spread around the world and they would return to the land of their forefathers eventually. Yes. And this has happened. So you can't stop God's prophecies coming to fruition. Mm. All you can do is manage the situation within it. Yeah. So I, I, I personally would like a two-state solution. Because it, it does, it does actually say in the Bible that the, it says Zion will be redeemed through justice, and those who return to her through justice. But a calamity awaits the rebels and the sinners, and, they, and the God forsaken, they'll perish. So every every, every Jew who, who calls himself a Zionist who believes that you know, they should be able to return, have got to make sure they're doing it with justice, in which case they'll be okay, rather than those who are doing it wrongly without justice, who, who will who will perish. So. Um, and, and I, so, I'm so you don't think there's any biblical obstacle to a two-state solution, then? Um, no. All, all it says is that Zion will be redeemed through justice. Now, maybe a two-state solution will be a temporary measure until the Messiah comes, and then you'll know what to do. But oh. until then, until then, I, I can only see the two-state situ- uh, solution being, being the only way, and unless someone come up with a better plan. So. I mean, the problem here has been actually depicted perfectly by two calls. You and the chap in Kingston. Um, I, I, I think it was... Well, I've had two Davids today. I can't keep track of all the names. But the chap in Kingston who was talking about colonialism because you, you are describing a divine right, aren't you? Uh, yes, absolutely. And absolutely. that is that in, in many ways, if the other people... <laughs> also think they've got a divine right to do what they're doing, then never the twain shall meet. Indeed, indeed, yes. And it becomes really um, a fairly, for the outsider listening in, it becomes a fairly surreal conversation about whose divine is writer. Well, it depends. I think there are millions and millions of Christians in the world who, who believe the Bible. Millions, uh, and well, they believe the New the Testament. Quran, they believe the New Testament. Yes, but the, the New Testament, and uh, cause, because... Um, and Jesus to be fair, most said, most of us don't believe all of it, you know. Otherwise, we'd we'd, yeah. we'd be trying to get through the eye of a needle, wouldn't we? I agree. But but in Matthew chapter five verse eighteen, um, Jesus, in his own words, said, "Think not that I've come to change the law or the prophets." So, in other words, all the prophets from the Old Testament, and there were several of them: Moses, Amos, Isaiah, who all predicted that the Jews would be spread around the world, but would return. 
any believing Christian but, but, should but say, it, but, okay, well, Jesus uh, yeah, I mean, crikey, you've certainly brought religion smack bang into the middle of the conversation, haven't you, John? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether I, I should thank important. you or cut you off immediately, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yes. Yeah. Um, but, but it is there. It is, and uh, well, okay. Then I'm going to ask you the question that I don't think anyone can answer. Yeah. What role does religion play in the current bombing of Gaza? Um, well, okay, I'll answer that because the Quran, very specifically, it includes the prophecy about the Jews returning. So Hamas, in their charter, they call in their charter it says they're governed by the Quran, but the Quran includes the prophecy that was given to Moses about the Jews, um, well, the children of Israel, they call it, um, returning. So, Hamas are going against their own Quran. Well, it's and a Quran, Abrahamic religion, though, isn't it? So, wouldn't they it, argue yeah. that, de- that your definition of the children of Israel is not the same as theirs? Well, they shouldn't do, because it's, it's quite clear in the Old Testament who the children of Israel are. It's the descendants of, of um, Jacob, and they're generally known as uh, the Jews, because there's a lot of lost tribes, but there's... Um, um, so um, that they, they they know who the Jews are when they're targeting them to kill them. I'm going to so, put I'm going to I I'm going to push you to a more um, coherent answer in the context yeah. of in the context of whether or not what role is religion playing in the in the Israeli decision to drop these bombs. Ah, oh, oh, sorry. Yes, I, I was referring to the, the Hamas uh, yes. attacking. Yeah. Oh well. In a way, every country's got a right to defend itself. It's in well, not, international law. That, that's not religion, though, is but, it? Or is it? Because then, I, I, I then you move I'm you move into the conflation of Israeli with Jewish, which, of course, is a huge part of the problem with anti-Semitism. Yeah, so uh, the way I'd sort of try and crystallise it then is every country's got the right to defend itself, but a country mustn't go too far. There, there are limits. And I would say that Israel is overstepping the limits in, in, in its bombing. I know they say that they send text messages to everyone in the building before they p- put a bomb on it. But there's so many, you know, so about nearly 2,000 people have died in that bombing. And, um, and so I would say because they've been prioritising building settlements mm. instead of making peace, they've got to accept that the other side is going to sort of be much massively against that. And so it is a re- is, they've reaped partly, they've reaped the, 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 the consequences of not doing enough to try and make peace because they're prioritising building more... And, and, and this is oddly missing from a lot of uh, British coverage, actually. Is, is, uh, there was one very good piece in The Times today where uh, they quote at length an Israeli, a Times of Israel columnist who, who we quoted yesterday describing the, the jeopardy in which Netanyahu finds himself and the blame being directed at him for much of what has happened and is happening in the context both of diplomatic failure and intelligence failure. John, thank you. Um, crikey, I, I, it was a very helpful contribution, but it, it takes us up to the, the, the brick wall that runs through all of these sort of conversations, which is two people who believe completely different things think that they've both got a divine right to do what they want. Although John uh, offered up a, a little bit of biblical cherry picking, but he did offer up a textual basis For his position, um, 10.44 is the time. Let's go to Rahaf in Reading. Rahaf, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Thank you very much for taking my call. I'm sorry I'm a little bit nervous, so bear with me. me. It's only me, and it's such a straightforward, simple, uncontroversial topic, Rahaf. What could possibly (laughs) go wrong? (laughs) I know, I know. So anyway, I'll keep it uh, simple. I, I don't think it's about religion. I believe it's about... Power, land, um, authority, colonialism, as a previous caller has said, because and my and my uh, reason for that is that uh, I see lots of uh, Jewish people against uh, Israel, and, yes. uh, and and we have to distinguish between Ju- Judaism uh, or Jews and Zionists or well, you well, know the you Zionism. See, you see Jewish people mm. against some of the actions of the Israeli state. You don't see many opposed to the existence of the Israeli state, do you? Or do you? Sorry, I don't understand your question, James. So I see mean? lots of Jews who are opposed perhaps to Likud in particular, to mm. Netan- Netanyahu, to certain policies, mm. to, to settlements, to occupation. But I don't see many Jews, I don't personally come across many Jews who reject 
the idea that the state of Israel should exist where it currently exists? It, it, it might not be many, but I think if you attend any of the marches for peace or for freedom for Palestine, etc., you do see them saying that. I've seen lots okay. of uh, uh, lots of uh, posts on social media with uh, you know uh, Jewish people. Uh, condemning what's happening and actually saying this is uh, completely against our religion. That's, I not, think what I, that's not what I said. Though. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter. You, mm-hmm. you move on to tell me why you rang in. Yeah, I mean, as I say, that's the main reason that, you know, that I felt that it's it's not about religion, because actually before the, uh, uh, the before the establishment of Israel, um, different uh, religions lived peacefully side by side. And it was only when, uh, you know, whatever the world or whoever it was decided that it's uh, uh, there needs to be a, an exclusive uh, homeland for only Jews that, uh, that it starts to not, create problems that's, because that's, you don't allow just let me finish, because you yeah. don't allow everybody to have the equal rights. So unfortunately, then you know it becomes a bit conflated that it's about religion and the people are anti-Semitic if they're anti, uh, you know, the Zionist ideology. But uh, by nature, the Zionist ideology is. Uh, is 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 inherently uh, prejudiced or, uh, or or gives exclusive rights to one people over another. I, I don't mind, you know, what we want to call it, but uh, at the end of the, you know, that can be likened to apartheid or, um, uh, you know, oppression, uh, occupation, whatever you want to call it. But ultimately, um, that's what it's about. So it's it's not about uh, Jews versus Muslims or anything like that. It's about a, a, a colonizer who has, uh, you know, well, uh, oppressed uh, a certain okay, people some for quite provoca- so many years. Some quite provocative mm-hmm. language there, but that goes with the territory. Why is Hamas called the Islamic resistance movement then? Well, um, it, it might be by uh, it might be by a group of Muslims, but it doesn't necessarily mean that all Muslims agree with their ideology or their tactics. But ultimately, so you, you found know, you um, found the common ground, really, the, the the Jews and the Muslims who don't agree with what mm-hmm. their quote side end quotes are doing. I wonder if we'd be yeah. in a better place if we put them in charge. But, uh, well, I, I mean, as I say, I think we need, you know, ultimately, I don't think any religion or religious person wants anybody to die, whether they are. Uh, I, I just think we should just treat human loss as human loss, regardless of whether it's. And that is that is know, where uh, politics yeah. perhaps is a much more powerful engine than religion is, although and I can't let your comments pass without pointing out that the uh, foundation of the modern state of Israel uh, as a um, as a Jewish homeland was a consequence of, uh, in in part was a consequence of Jew- Jewishness and Judaism being the criteria for um, for the Holocaust so you, 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 you can see the I suppose the historical balance or tension in that decision in that process thank you Rahaf Oof, 1048 is the time 10.52 is the, time, is the time. It was the Telegraph, not the Times today, where I read the commentary that I found most enlightening, which is a, a very rare thing for me to say, given that the comment pages of the Daily Telegraph are the most unintentionally hilarious outlet that this country, arguably that this country, certainly that this country's media has ever seen. You get a sort of long queue of people like David Frost and Nick Timothy um, uh, sort of coming from positions of abject failure politically, <laughs> opining on why everyone should do what they think and, and why everyone should do what they want. Imagine that, the, the sort of architects of um, the, the hostile environment and the negotiator of Brexit both being paid. <laughs> to share their views on what politicians should be doing next. That's how mad. Thankfully, someone's written a book about exactly how mad everything is at the moment and exactly how the ecosystem in which all of the madness... Um, that was created could unfold, and I'm delighted to tell you it's out on November the second. Uh, you can order it wherever you get your your um, your books. Um, How they broke Britain by some some idiot called James O'Brien. But this piece by Paul Nuki in the Telegraph is really good. Um, uh, there is a reasonable chance Benjamin Netanyahu will be remembered as both Hamas's nemesis and its enabler. It's I, I recommend it because it, it crystallizes something I've been trying to explain to you all week and it quotes Tal Schneider the Times of Israel columnist that I mentioned yesterday who has written that the idea behind Netanyahu's policy 
um, was to prevent Abbas, the Palestinian Authority president, prevent Mohammed Abbas or anyone else in the Palestinian Authority's West Bank government from advancing towards the establishment of a Palestinian state. And that, I think, sums up why everything's so hard to do without being either simplistic or, uh, or, or, or blindly partisan. It's so hard to do. You condemn without any reservation whatsoever the Hamas attacks upon Israel. But that doesn't mean, I don't think, that you have to support everything that Israel does, quotes in response, end quotes, or quotes in retaliation, end quotes, or quotes in revenge, end quotes. And I haven't got the question quite right today, which is not my fault, he says. It's a consequence of the topic. And so what... Really, what I want to do is just look at everything that we've been talking about since last Monday through the lens of religion. That perhaps is how I should have phrased it, rather than having to turn it into questions, but to make it interrogatory. So, so why are we not talking more about religion? I think probably how important is religion to what is happening is better than why aren't we talking about religion. But then you get into the specifics of it, and it gets very, very, very tricky. Are people in Gaza currently being bombed because they are Muslim? Were Israelis killed by Hamas last weekend killed because they are Jewish? In which case, what role is religion playing in everything that is unfolding? Uh, I'm also, of course, always on a learning curve. Um, uh, this is from Syed, who says, many Orthodox Jews in the UK totally oppose the creation of Israel. They believe it's contrary to Judaism, and they attend free Palestine marches and believe that all people in the land should live under one state called Palestine. It is something that you can Google. Thank you for that. I, I, I'm kind of aware of the existence of these positions, but not of the popularity of them. I don't know how anybody can be. I don't know who is. And then when you talk about the, the, the appalling instances of anti-Semitism on the streets of Britain, which we all balk at, you do wonder quite what words would be used to describe a national television presenter this morning asking a British Palestinian politician whether her family connections meant that she had early information about an imminent terror attack. I can't get over that. I really can't get over that. And, and I do think it's evidence, perhaps, 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 it's evidence of imbalance, isn't it? Some form of imbalance, some form of hierarchy. So you, you, I operate in the British media where somebody who's been in it for a lot longer than I have doesn't even pause to think whether it is appropriate to ask a British Palestinian woman if her family in, in Israel and uh, the, well, in the Middle East, West Bank, if her family could have given her a quick heads up that there was going to be a massive terrorist atrocity last weekend, and there's no alarm in the back of his head. So I've got alarms going off in the back of my head pretty much all the time at the moment, thinking, no, that would be wrong, that's inappropriate, that doesn't mean what it is. And, and th those alarms are so important. It's why you don't hear me talking about, you know, BBC vocabulary or, 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 or Wembley Stadium um, flags. It's not, it's not important to the much, much bigger picture. The stuff that is important, it's, a, it's, it's an absolute minefield, metaphorical minefield. But I think, I think if you had to boil it down to a single digestible nugget, the idea that you can simultaneously condemn completely, completely what happened in Israel last Saturday, while also somehow pray that Israel doesn't go as far as it seems destined to, and even perhaps as it already has, in response. And that is an intellectually fraught position, even for people who don't have any investment, which is why today felt like a good day for looking at it through the lens of religion. Uh, Tom's in Birmingham. Tom, what would you like to say? Um, I think that I don't think the bombing in Gaza is to do with religion particularly, but I think the failure of the two-state solution, the, the inevitable failure of the two-state solution is because of religion. Well, why do you say inevitable? So holy sites you're, about, you're about to tell me Jerusalem. why you say it inevitable, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> There's so many holy sites in Jerusalem for Judaism and Islam that there's, there's never going to be an agreement on how to split Israel. Um, 
Is it, is, it, is it worth distinguishing between ownership and access at this point, or is that naive? I, d- I don't think... I mean, you could, I'm sure, at one point... If, but we've gone so far down the road that I don't think either side would trust the other side to grant them access. Yeah. This is why if you look at the map of the West Bank, you've got sort of this finger that goes into the middle of it, which is where Jerusalem is. Yes. And when they talk about the settlements in the West Bank, the location of the settlements beyond the Green Line is the worry is that they will encircle Jerusalem and they talk about facts on the ground um, that they'll encircle Jerusalem and then the the land that would be granted to Israel in a Mm. two-state solution would include all of Jerusalem. Which would not be Um, ever agreed to by Palestinians. Precisely. Um, and, and when we say settlements, I mean, it's, it sounds quite quaint, but some of the settlements are enormous. So some of the settlements are 80,000 people. Well, one of the settlements, Ariel, has a university. Um, so it's, the, a, it's, the, a, it's a de facto, what's the word you'd use? Because uh, settlement, I think you're suggesting, is a bit of a euphemism. Yeah. But we say settlements because ostensibly they're they're temporary, right? Because they're against UN law. But if if there was a giant peace agreement, they, they Palestine's never going to get that land back. The cities are too big, and this this is the worry. I mean, and obviously nothing justifies what Hamas has done. Hamas is a terrorist organization. Yes. Um, and but but they're they're panicking they're worried because Netanyahu supports settlements and if you look at um, I think it was 2018 they brought in the the new nationalism law that said that I something like the right to national self determination determination is uniquely Jewish uh, it's. It's it's hard to talk about it without talking about apartheid. Because I, I was about to say that that's where the word apartheid assumes a resonance that it didn't have before Benjamin Netanyahu was prime minister. I think because it, legally he's he's brought in laws that make Arabic to that makes Palestinians that even if they lived in Jerusalem, it makes them a second class citizen. With fewer rights, less, less yeah, less rights. And that is, you can Which, call that second class, I think. I mean, apartheid always and brings up images can, of South Africa and, and, and colour bars and segregation yeah. and what have you. But but I suppose another definition of it would just be a hierarchy of basic rights. Yeah. Well, it's sort of... So from Hamas's point of view... system in India. The, 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 for, yes, OK. So from Hamas's point of view, everything that is ever said on this programme by anybody is open to challenge by anybody else. I, I, I always make that point, but... And as we sort of grope towards better understanding of things, sometimes perhaps we go, I go in the wrong direction. But I, I find what you say fascinating. So from Hamas's point of view, uh, a, a situation of perpetual enmity, they're choosing between two situations of perpetual enmity, one in which they still have access to or, 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 or dominion over some of the areas surrounding Jerusalem, even as Israel encroached further into them, or one in which Israel has essentially captured the entire environ of of Jerusalem. So Hamas would still be in a state of perpetual war with Israel, but they would just have less hand less land, including yeah. including. And if you look at the ceasefire, doesn't benefit the Hamas's cause, which is why the ceasefires always fail. If you look at yeah. the, the status quo when there is a ceasefire. Gaza, where Hamas controls, is is surrounded completely. Yes, there's there's a, a few a few gates where you can pass through and goods can pass through, but it's surrounded. And how long would if there was a ceasefire, a grand peace agreement, and there was a ceasefire, how long would Palestinians in these settlements have to sit tight and not do anything before the walls came down? Mm. It doesn't. It doesn't benefit them. The ceasefire. No, I understand that. I understand that. Good grief. So, I, I mean, I hesitate to ask you this question. There's, there's no, there's. 
what you, what's your definition of a two state solution then? Because it because it could never you you reject it out of hand. So we are just looking at perpetual bloodshed. I, I, I don't think because you've got the dome and the rock and the temple mount, yes. and that's that's in East Jerusalem. But there there are other holy sites, and I just I just don't think that, that anyone's ever going to say you can have two, that. You can have that two one. Tribes, for want of a better words, living side by side. I don't think there is a better word, is there? It's, it's an old old time word. Well, well, but, I know, yeah. but it does the job, doesn't it? It does the job. Tom, I'm incredibly late for the news, which is a compliment to how um, riveted I was, frankly, by your analysis and explanation. So thank you. It's 11.04. Eight minutes after 11, a, li a little later than uh, I'd normally come back from a news break because of the call that we took just before it. Once again, uh, evidence of how we have managed over our years together. Sound like an old married couple, don't we? All, all our years together. We've managed to... Uh, um, uh, elevate the radio phone in into territory that I'm not sure it ever reached before. Although there is always idiots is idiots corner um, to bring us back to reality, and Chris goes there today. So you may have heard me talk earlier about an idea being intellectually unsustainable. Now that that of course um, refers to the uh, to the use of the word in intellectual to uh, describe or relate to the intellect as opposed to a person being an intellectual. So if I say that idea is intellectually into unsustainable, it means the intellect can't sustain it. You could describe it, if you like, in, as an, almost a synonym for cognitive dissonance. But Chris decided to get in touch saying, James is labelling himself as an intellectual. <laughs> really? So, mate, that is stupid on so many different levels that it's almost heartbreaking that you won't be bright enough to understand just how many, or indeed just why. So even on a day like today, Idiot's Corner is still... Still doing good, still doing brisk business. Back to the challenge, well, the, the twin challenge of looking at events in Israel and Gaza through the lens of religion and the question of whether or not it's important to do so or whether or not it's possible not to. There you go. Rufus is in Stanmore. Rufus, what would you like to say? Hello, James. The supporters of uh, Israel and Palestine are a bit like football supporters. Uh, we, we really have great difficulty in seeing the merits of the other side. Um, anyway, um, yes. a, a, quick, a quick look at geography and then religion. Um, <laughs> until the 4th century, Jews were in the majority, then the Christians, then the Turks, th then Britain. Um, and, and the Muslims have a view that once they're in control of a land, it's theirs forever. So there's where some of the, the, the Muslim view comes from. Yes. Um, if you look at the charter of Hamas and the PLO, they say from the river to the sea. Well, what does that mean? They want all of that land. Which there was there was a there, there was a slightly more nuanced conversation about that on the breakfast show today. But but you you are yeah. of course entitled to your analysis, which I think in the case of the Hamas charter is definitely true. But it doesn't necessarily yeah. mean that everyone who deploys that slogan today is is talking about an eradication of Israel. Absolutely. Now, twenty percent of the population of current Israel are, are Muslim. And they are those who choose to live peacefully in that land, and they work, and they uh, they provide their doctors, and their nurses, and they uh, and lawyers, and and they're in society. But you've then got those who don't accept and choose to live peacefully, and and that's where the Hamas and PLO problems come from. So um, it, it, then that does come down to religion. Um, and then you've got a bit of modern history. You, you, you suggested a while ago that the problem started after the Holocaust. Well, I'd like to take it back to 1880 with the pogroms in Russia and the Jews decided to leave Russia. And, and some of them walked to Palestine. Um, and that's... And, and, so the population began to grow, and then the the Sheikh of Palestine of, of Jerusalem, Sheikh Amin Al Husseini, in about 1930, he didn't like the fact that there were so many Jewish people coming in, and they were buying up some of the land, and he thought that they the, the Jews were going to overrun the land, and he issued a fatwa of blessed is he who kills a Jew. And so that this is this is 100% religion. 
and then he went and he went and and spoke to the Iranians and he spoke to Hitler and he said look if you want to get rid of the Jews and you send them to me well um, th- that's not going to work because we don't want them so why don't you just kill them so that started that helped the the, the Nazis um, but um, modern day Israel um, if you choose to live peacefully in that land, you are welcome. There are hundreds of different religions uh, and people living I, there. I, this is where I will push back a little, because I think your yeah. analysis is ignoring the nation-state law, isn't it? Well, I, I don't know the nuances of that. Well, it's, 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 of it's, that. it's five years old, and it, it, it states that the right to exercise national self-determination in Israel is unique to the Jewish people. It downgrades Arabic um, as a as a language to a to a special status, and it and it establishes, and I'm quoting, Jewish settlement as a national value, and it mandates that the state will labour to encourage and promote its establishment and development. And those settlements are, I, I think, I think, in contravention of. United Nations resolutions. So I think it's a, li- and I know it wasn't your intention, but but in 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 another man's mouth, it might have sounded a little disingenuous to talk about people who wish to live in peace when when they yes. are being rendered second class by legislation. Well, I see the street signs in Israel, and they're in Hebrew and English and and Arabic. Yes. Um. Um. I, I was. But, but I'm reading you. I'm I reading was, you words a- from from yeah, legislation yeah. that has been passed in the Knesset. I was in a hospital in Israel, and I was treated by seven. Um, uh, no, no, I, I, Arab, I know, but Arab this doctors. is. I'm reading you laws. Yeah. Okay. And you're responding oh. with anecdotes. Okay. Um, but um, that's, that's okay. Do we, don't, we don't. We don't. We don't. We don't have to do more. You've 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 made an excellent contribution already. But I just had to point out that that it's a contribution that completely ignores the last five years of of. of Netanyahu's government and the entire point of the nation state law. But there and Hamas are, there existed are, Hamas are, existed there, before the nation state law, so it's not a game changer or a or a zinger, but it is very intrinsic to what you've said. Okay. I think. I, I, I know it is, actually. That's, that's, I mean, that's why I read it out. Rufus, thank you. David's in uh, well, hang on, it's eleven fifteen. It is eighteen minutes after eleven, and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC, where we I'll continue talking about the uh, uh, escalating situation in the Middle East because uh, that word escalating is one of the most frightening in the English language, particularly when you are contemplating war or or, or war-like scenarios. And, And I am drawn once again to this analysis in The Telegraph today um, about the what is described as a reasonable chance Benjamin Netanyahu will be remembered as both Hamas's nemesis and its enabler because however proportionate or disproportionate the response is to last weekend's terror attack, the, the, the support for it, if it in some way is a consequence of policies pursued by the man governing Israel, becomes, I think, intellectually and morally very, very difficult. Very difficult. 19 after 11 is the time. So... How would you describe the role of religion in this 21st century conflagration? David is in Brighton. David, what would you like to say? Uh, hello, hello, James. Hi. Yeah. Um, right, I'm a regular listener to your program. Thank you. Uh, I am an old um, man. Yeah. Um, uh, aren't we I'm all? Aren't we all, David? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm older. Than, yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. So I'm 81. So right. um, I was born in 1942. Um, and I've been, uh, uh, I'm a, a, an adult teacher, teacher of politics. Okay. And I have been fascinated from my youth in anti-Semitism, in uh, the origins of um, uh, Christianity and, and the, the split between Judaism and Christianity. Yes. And I'm also a student of Islam and have read quite a few books about the history of of Islam. Okay. Now, I've got in front of me on my desk here, on my small little computer desk, two little books. One is uh, by uh, a man called Tariq Fatah, and it's called The Jew is Not My Enemy. Yeah. And it's all about the, um, about the relationship between Jews and, and Muslims. And I've got another book um, uh, by Jeffrey Weidlinger, In the Midst of Civilized Europe, 
Um, uh, the subtitle is the 1918-1921 pogroms in Ukraine and the onset of the Holocaust, in which he says that between the years 1918, 1919, 1921, uh, well over a million Jews were killed in pogroms in mostly the Ukraine yes. during the Russian Civil War. Now, Okay, so you've opened um, a, a very large subject. <laughs> you can you can say that again, that, and somewhat ridiculously, I do have to yeah, re- remind you of the no. constraints of time, David. Okay, well, now so right, okay, so I'm, I'm sort of uh, getting into the fact that last week you were your emphasis on the uh, what's been happening, the events is all on the level of the moral plane about killing, the, 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 the morality of killing. That was certainly right? true of one or two of, of, of the five shows we did last week. Oh, all right, OK. And this week now, it's uh, religion now. Today. I, I think... Not yesterday. I think what, what, what's, in, what's in play here, James, yes. is the relationship between what we call religion and what we call politics. Now these are these are now in in the Western side in Western mind two separate categories: religion on the one hand and politics on the other. But in fact, in history, you'll find that they're often one of the same. That well, in that in that, that case, phenomenon. well, I, I understand exactly what you're saying. I, 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 I'm not sure it needed to be said. Yet, because I think it, it's it does, fairly clear. Because, because this, is, I, this the, the, is the kicker. Well, no, okay, hang on, because what, what what I'm Perhaps I, I think I've been fairly clear. Today's conversation is about the role played by religious belief, I think, rather than religiosity or religiousness. Uh, well, religious, religious belief, religious identity, I think, is what you're looking for. I, religious identity. It's possibly now, religious identity, but as a consequence of religious belief, well, this which is, is distinct from politics, see, of course. Hold it, James. Jews. Well, okay, I'm holding it. Some Jews, <laughs> some Jews are religious. Yes. Some Jews are not religious. Now, can we say the same of Muslims? Yes. Some Muslims are religious. Some Muslims are not religious. But yes. here's the kicker. Okay. If, you're a, if the majority of Muslim clerics and thinkers would say that a Muslim who is not religious is an apostate. Right. And is worthy of death. In, in the ultimate. Well, I don't yes. think the, the majority of, of Muslim uh, clerics would, would, would call for the death of unbelievers. Would, well, what I'm saying to you is... No, that, that is what you it, just said. I definitely heard those words. And, I, and I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm saying that's yeah. not true. But I'm saying that mm, it, it's very difficult not to generalise because... I, uh, we do uh, okay. OK, right. Uh, so I'm generalising here. Yes. So if you look at the, uh, at the history... Well, you're, you're, of also being quite, you're also being quite offensive, David. I, I, I'm sure it's not your intention, but you can't, you can't just say most Muslim clerics want non-believers to be put to death and, and then sort of gloss over it and describe it as a generalisation. Well, Unless no, you truly believe it. Going a bit too far. Well, but, well, perhaps I'm, going I'm a bit trying, too far, yes. What I'm trying to say is that Judy, Judaism... Judaism is religion, okay? Yes. Now, how can you be Jewish and not and not follow the religion? The answer is because Judy because the Jews are a people. Yes, and this is where you meant religious identity. Yeah, the Jews are a people. Yes. Now, so if you're an how if you're on So what, what what you've got is one word to describe Jews and two words Muslim and Arab to describe people in Gaza. Uh, yes, but what's happened in the last thirty years, as I was saying to your producer before, is that what's become political is now religious, and Iran is the perfect example of that. So you have the, it's the Islamic Republic of Iran. I, my, okay? my my temptation at this point would be to yes. focus in on more issues rather than broader stuff we've already perhaps mentioned and articulated, yeah. rather than broadening it out even further, because we started in the 1880s. <laughs> yeah, but what I'm, what, what I'm trying to get... Yes. Well, it's a, very, it's a very big subject. You can it say that again. Difficult. And, I, and I, do, I do have to get some other calls on before the news. So, I, 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 mean, I know you do. So I I, you do. Let, me, let me hit you with the, with the horrible question. Yes. The people who will die in Gaza today, yes. what role is religion playing in their death? What role is their religion playing in their death? The role is that 
Hamas is the, as you rightly said uh, at the beginning of the program, is the Islamic resistance movement. Yes, but the people Hamas dying today are not Hamas. They're not Hamas. Hamas is not interested in secular political divisions of territory into Palestinians over but I'm here. Not, I'm not talking about Egyptians Hamas. I'm not there. talking about Hamas. I'm talking about an eight-year-old boy who's going to die today. Well, yes, the result, yes, I, I know. And it, it, it's terrible. And it's happening because of, of the events of Saturday. But is it happening and, because of his religion? Uh, no, of course not. Of course not. So, so when Israel is attacking Gaza, which they are, yes. and killing Arabs and Palestinians, which they are, that's not out of any religious um, impulse. When Hamas sent in their 1,000, 2,000 people to slaughter the Jews of southern Israel, as in a pogrom, yes. as in Eastern Europe and Russia, in the, in the 19th century and early 20th century, they were doing that because they were Jews. Not because entirely Israel because they were Jewish Jews. State. Because otherwise and the word a, occupation to, wouldn't be part of the conversation, would it? Well, but we they were doing know. it because those people who are Jews are in that part of the world. Correct. They're in that part of the world because which makes of it different from a pogrom. Which makes it different from a pogrom, oddly. No, it does. because... Because it would have to have been an attack on people who were sort of living as a minority in another country, being attacked by the majority for it to be a pogrom. This was an attack by a minority in a territory on a majority. So I think... What, what, no, I don't. Well, I well think it was. That's a rather that, twisted definition okay, of a pogrom. Well, uh, well, maybe it is, but I, I, it, yes. statistically, they're two very, very different things. Uh, that's all. And here's the thing. And I think you're right, and I've understood most of what you've said. But here's the thing. If something is undertaken for religious reasons, how can the response not be religious? Because someone might be responding for other reasons. It's very simple. It's not. It is. No, it isn't. If I, it's like a, 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 a counterbalance. It's like if I push for religious reasons and you push back against my religious reasons, that is a religious no, process. No, but the pushback is against the violence, not against the reasons but for the The pushback violence. is violence. Yes, but it's not bec the pushback. Yeah, but it's got nothing to do with religion at that point. But of course it has, because you wouldn't be doing it if it wasn't for religion. Who's not doing what? There'd be I'm, no I'm push. There'd be nothing here. to be Who's pushed. Not there'd what? be nothing to be pushing back against if it wasn't for religion. You you live here, yes. and you are being you're being pogromed. Okay, you're being slaughtered in the most despicable, brutalistic ways. Yes, right, with very sadistic ways, right. Big, big, the, because the of your religion, of the people because, doing be, because of your not religion, just because you're occupiers, these are Jewish occupiers. Yes. So I'm saying there's a diff. So the whole the point is that I am. We are going to have to go to the news. Christianity has go come on. to terms with Jews. Yes. Right. Well, but kind Islam of. I mean, post, post, post 1945, you're talking now, are you? I'm talking. You don't have to go uh, back very far in your life. David, to, to find yeah. fairly compelling evidence of Christianity not having come to terms with Jews at all. They, they came to terms with Jews in, in sort of the wider political historical sense in the 18th century. Well, then what, what, when, what was the Holocaust all about then? The, the Holocaust was about racism. Oh. So Jews, anti-Semitism, there are two types of anti-Semitism. We've got all the way up to the news. And, and I, 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 I've enjoyed talking to you enormously. Um, uh, and I hope I do so again. But you, you understand that there are 1.4 million people listening, so I can't, I can't really let, let um, one of those many have much more time than I've allowed you. It's half past 11. Thomas Watts is here with the headlines. It is 34 minutes after 11, and um, it is uh, a jigsaw of linguistic illusory conceptual manipulation, according to Russell which is quite a mouthful, isn't it? But on we go. Um, and I'm not sure that there, there is any solution to, to what is happening, but I felt that religion was the element of the conversation that hadn't been properly explored. We'll, we'll explore it for a little longer. Um, uh, and then the conversation about what, well, the decision about what we talk about next will be taken together. Nimrod's in Barnet. Nimrod, what would you like to say? Hi. Uh, hi, James. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm a British-Israeli Jew, um, and... As such, I think I've got a bit of perspective here on, on, on 
so maybe the the the, uh, the double meaning of, of of the word Jewish or Judaism. Well, Judaism is a religion, but it is also a national, ethnic, cultural identity. Yes. And uh, and and I think if you look at Israel as a Jewish state, it has almost none of the religious uh, significance that you would expect to have in a in a Jewish religious state. Um, but on the flip side of it, it is the state of the Jewish people, and that is very largely defined as people who have Jewish heritage. So that is a very national definition, and that is, I think, sort of the core yes. of Zionism I- as as a movement was to create or, or to um, to bring to surface the the national element of Judaism. And I think when, when Israel fights to defend itself, it fights for the nation, not for religious reasons. I also don't think it is 100% a religious war that, from Hamas's that, perspective. That, that, that just before we move on to Hamas, let's just, just explore that a little further. It, yeah. I, I mean, you're obviously right. The, the uh, to, to to take it to its most brutal conclusion, the Holocaust was not undertaken because of the religious beliefs of Jewish people. Yeah, I, I will. I, I will probably not hang my identity on the way Nazis have seen what Jews are. Um, but, no, but and, but and, the and also, but the foundation but the foundation of the state of Israel. Uh, all week uh, has been for me almost inextricable from that question of where do we go. I find the position slightly dodgy because, yeah. first of all, Zionism preceded the Holocaust. Yes, it did, of course. Uh, and, 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 and Jewish nationalism preceded the Holocaust. Yes. But also because the the relationship of the Jewish people to the land of Judea, to to what we call today the land of Israel, is historically much, much older than 1945, 1939. It's not been created by the Nazis, and, and, no, but, and, and but, the but, Jewish but, national identity has not been created by the Nazis. Yeah, but, but, but I mean, isn't that sort of seeking a unique status in history, the ebb and flow of humanity across territories? It's only perhaps because the Jewish identity, because of religion, is uniquely codified. That you can I mean, talk, you can that, talk about can that be- because how many of us, when we do those genealogy tests, how many of us have got particularly deep links with with the part of the world that we live in? Nowhere near as many as we thought. Well, I mean, I'm Jewish and I don't live in Israel at the moment. I no. live in Barnet, as, as you said, but 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 that doesn't mean that I don't have a relationship, a spiritual relationship to the place where my ancestry came from. Yes. Uh, we've seen, but then we've so seen, do Muslims. We've seen diasporic so, populations. So, so do Muslims have a... Have, and I hope you're not going to say, but mine is older. No, absolutely no. not. And, and, and I absolutely 100% accept not only the Muslim general spiritual relationship yes. to the land of Israel uh, 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 and to Jerusalem specifically, but also the Palestinian yes. claim uh, uh, that... Uh, they they are as a nation. They are a nation who that was born in that region. That's yes. why I think uh, the people should share it. I think this is a, a faith that's shared by a lot of Israelis, and unfortunately, not enough Palestinians at the moment. But that is, okay. I think, besides the point. But that, that is, that's land, not religion. Yes, yes, not I understand. Nationality, that. not yeah. religion. Um, now, on the events of October seventh, there were several occasions of non-Jews being brutally attacked. We know of one, uh, or, or more than one. We know of a few uh, um, Thai foreign workers. It was an, indis- it was an indiscriminate terror attack. I think we know. Uh, we-, we know of a Jew, of a Jewish, of a, of a Muslim Arab doctor. Yes, knowingly attacked, even though he had made it very clear he was a Muslim Arab. So, can we say that it was Islam guiding these attacks? I don't think so. I think I think you know Hamas are calling themselves uh, an Islamic organization. But I think they would sooner kill Muslims than let the state of Israel exist in any borders and in any form. They would see the Muslim doctor as some sort of collaborator. I don't even think that's the thing. I think when I think it's not different than when Hamas is preventing people from leaving an area they know is going to be bombarded. Yes. They don't care about Humanity. Palestinian lives or yeah. human lives, yeah. regardless of religion. They care that the state of Israel will not exist in any borders. We're not talking about 1967 borders. We're talking about from the river to the sea. That's the chant. Mm. From the river to the sea is a genocidal chant. It, 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 well, specifically when Hamas use it, it is. I think it's a little bit more nuanced when other people use it, but I didn't think that until I heard callers to Nick's show this morning, so I'm just being a, a, a bit pedantic. 
Uh, how is it not? There are two people between the river and the sea. I heard you a couple. There were there, 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 no, the I know. There, there, there were a couple of callers who claimed that freedom uh, it, it didn't involve expulsion or, 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 or uh, removal. So I, I, the, listen, the, I, I'm not one of them, and I, and I'm, I wasn't. I'm just saying that that was a perspective that was, I thought, represented fairly. Um, effectively earlier on LBC, but I, w- I wasn't there and you weren't listening, so I'm, I'm just, just putting it in the mix. Otherwise, in the context of Hamas, of course it's a genocidal ambition, of course it's a, or, or, or at least a ethnic cleansing, if not yeah. genocide. Um, and that, that, yeah, that's helpful. It's not helpful in terms of optimism, but it's helpful in terms of, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's helpful yeah. in terms of compre- comprehension. I'll, I'll tell you something about optimism, James, if you'll allow me, and that is that, so, as a Jewish person, about 10 days after the October 7th event, I really find it difficult to be optimistic. Yeah. And I'm saying that as someone who has been uh, a peace activist for, for the vast majority of his life before we've left Israel. And one of the reasons I've left Israel is that I didn't want to take part in what's going on there anymore. And I didn't want my taxpayers' money to pay for the, the, uh, uh, the actions of the military in the West Bank, etc. Um, and, and it's heartbreaking for me to be in this position where, where, where I'm thinking... You know what? This is the level of hatred that we're seeing. This is the level of... of can that be a bridge? I, I don't think it can. Can, can I mean, it be excised? How can, can you, you reason someone who can decapitate a baby? I don't think you can. I, well, I, I'm not, that, again, that story, I'm not... Has it been completely confirmed? But it doesn't matter. I, 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 I'm perfectly happy to believe that it's possible. Can it be excised? So, in, can, what, in what way? Well, can it be cut out like a cancer, which is what Netanyahu seems to believe? I'm sure it can, but at what cost? We are having discussions about the cost of that excision. For yes. the part, and, and, and you and your radio show, by the way, very sensitively, Thank have you. been having these discussions for the past week. Yes. Because, because, because the moment that the, the Israeli reaction became, uh, uh, um, uh, tragically, yes. one that involves the death of civilians, we start asking about the price. Yes. So, yeah, I, I completely accept that Hamas, uh, uh, the excision of Hamas and the destruction of Hamas is, is a worthy goal. You've asked that question a few days ago in your. Uh, I think everything comes. I think everything comes down to this, to what you're about to say, doesn't it? Yeah, um, you've asked the question on Friday. I think you know, but but what, uh, what cost? How, yeah. how many? You, you've asked. I think a bit of a flippant question, if I may. Of course, uh, you how may. many dead children? Uh, uh, dead Palestinian children are 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 worthy? Are too many? Of, of, yeah, are too many. Yeah. Uh, I think. I, I think. I think. Um, I think I think it was telling that you didn't ask the, the pro Palestinian caller who called you from Watford. I forgot her name. How many dead Israeli children are worthy price to pay for in Palestine? But she wasn't which, supporting Hamas, though. She wasn't supporting Hamas. No, but she so was if she had been, if she did, well, I think if she was supporting yeah. Hamas, I probably wouldn't have put her on air. But if 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 she come close to offering up support for what happened on October the seventh, of course I would have asked her how many dead Israelis yeah, would but, be there. But, but, but saying things like "let's look at October 7th in context" is justifying, even if it's not supporting. It's providing justification, and yes. we need to ask that question. We need to ask. You know, we're looking at two worthy goals. I believe that Palestinian independence is a worthy goal. I believe that the decision of Hamas is a worthy goal. By the way, not not least because it stands in the way of Palestinian independence, which Netanyahu understands all too well. Which brings us back to another uh, sort of Gordian knot of, of 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 political complexity, doesn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. So that's, I, do you know what? I, I, I was going to push back, Nimrod, and talk about why optimism was both important and possible, but you've just robbed me of the ability to do that with your last eight sentences. <laughs> you, you know what? I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but but I'll, I'll, t- I'll tell you something else. Um, if, if you're looking for optimism these days, I, I wouldn't look at your Jewish friends for it. <sighs> I hear you. I do. And, I, and, I, and I'm sorry. I really am. It's quarter to 12. It is 11.47. We nearly got there. Thank you. Two hours of... I, I'm, I find it very uh, simultaneously fascinating and, 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 and challenging. I thought Nimrod got to the to the heart of the matter there with that reference at the end towards optimism and the impossibility of it because, you know, in probably in historical terms, we're, we're still in the earlier stages of, of this crisis, for want of a, of a better word. 11.48 is the time, but it's been an enlightening conversation in many ways. At least I've got one satisfied listener. Hi, James. I just wanted to say that I'm very grateful to hear all your logical conversations with people because it helps me to think twice about things and also improve my English as well at the same time. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you, sir. It's, uh, it's always nice to be appreciated. Malcolm's in Tel Aviv. Malcolm, what would you like to say? 
Good morning, James. Hello. Um, I don't. I don't think it has a religious uh, basis to this because um, when Israel attacks goes into Gaza, um, they're 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 not fighting people because they're Muslim or support Islam. They're, they're at the moment trying to get rid of Hamas, which is a different entity. Um, bear in mind that Jews aren't allowed to live in Gaza anyway. Um, what would be interesting is if Jews were living in Gaza, yeah. would Israel still be attacking? Um, I think the question would be yes, because they still need to get rid of the terrorists. Um, unfortunately, we've got 100 odd plus now Jews in Gaza, not by choice. You mean and soldiers? Israel is no, no, I'm talking about oh, the hostages. Oh, okay. So, I beg yeah. your pardon. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so, so, but Israel is still attacking. So, you can't say that's an Israel, uh, uh, a religious thing. Um, last night, we had four rocket attacks towards Tel Aviv, and part of Tel Aviv is Jaffa. We have yeah, the big various, Muslim population. Various, yeah, various mosques. Um, so I don't think, even the Hamas, I don't think it's a religious thing. They just want to get rid of Israel, period. Um, yes. Again, there was. But, but then, if, if, if I say why, you're going to struggle to answer that question without bringing religion into it. Um, why? They just don't. They just want Palestine. They just want. Maybe, I don't think they just want a Muslim uh, country, because right. obviously there's a lot of Arab Christians. Um, so, on that point, you're probably right. Maybe it's a religious thing on that. Mm. But then, what, again, just to get Jaffa for a minute, even Hezbollah in the north. They're targeting places like Akko and Haifa, which has a very large Arab, Christian and Muslim population. Um, I, I just, I personally just think they just want to destroy Israel, regardless of who you are. They don't care if you're Muslim, I, Christian, I, Buddhist. Yeah, I think you're right, probably. I, I mean, it's pretty close to what it says in their charter, isn't it? But it, it's also an impossible ambition. And in, so in the absence of... A, 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 an achievable ambition. They just want to kill as many Israelis as they can when they get the chance. Yeah, and that's, that's it's the development of their religion. If they're Israeli, they're Israeli. But I, the bit, if, they, yes. if they just happen to be a tourist, well, that's as with all terror attacks, isn't it? But yeah. but I yeah. don't I don't I don't conflate the actions of the Israeli army with the actions of Hamas. But I do refuse to see the death of an Israeli child as being in any way more or less poignant and heartbreaking than the death of a, of a Palestinian child or the death of a child in Gaza. Where do you derive your confidence that what the Israeli army is doing now and will do next is, is a, um, is, has a realistic prospect of wiping out Hamas forever? I don't think they can. So no, why I'm are they the, doing I'm this, the, then? I'm a, I'm a, I think you know, I'm a, I'm a new cameraman, so I've been in the West Bank, I've, I've with yes. Palestinian and, and Israeli doctors working every Saturday in a in an Arab village in the West Bank right. for free, giving out treatment. So I've seen both sides. Yeah. Um, you never get. You never get. I mean, I think you mentioned this yesterday. How can you stop Hamas going from the north to the south? Yeah, well, exactly. Where been, you can't because they're. So how are you going to get rid of all of Hamas? The answer is it's impossible. So how then, so then, what are the what are these deaths for then? These civilian deaths. What they for? They're 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 for try and get rid of as much of the terrorist factor as possible. And unfortunately, on both sides, you're going to get. And I, I told you, producer, I'm, I'm not going to use collateral damage. Oh. I hate that word. Um, you're, you're going to get civilian civilians deaths. on both sides. Yes, but that's closer to that's closer to conflating, isn't it? Than I than I have uh, uh, gone. You sort of. Uh, I, <laughs> That's the problem, isn't it? You can call it a terrorist atrocity, and then you can talk about civilian deaths as being the inevitable upshot of a, of a terrorist atrocity. But then, what what is the response if it's also going to cause countless civilian deaths without any guarantee of an objective being achieved, or without any prospect of the objective being achieved? Really, and even if you wiped out, I... if you could somehow magically identify everyone who is a member of Hamas today and kill them those places would be filled tomorrow by what is going to happen to people who aren't members of Hamas in Gaza in the next weeks. And, of course, the other problem is is you're, you're now um, forcing people from the north to the south, mm. and Hamas is just going to say to them, look, see what those Israelis have done to you? Well, yes, precisely. Your... That precisely. That becomes a sort of recruiting sergeant for future 
um, uh, membership or, or, or future jihad or whatever you want to call it. Malcolm, thank you and, and stay safe. I can't, I mean, it can't be a happy experience from any angle. What's what's going on in your part of the world at the moment? It's coming up to 11.54. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I, I am going to play you that clip of Richard Madeley again because I, I suspect we'll talk about it tomorrow. We'll maybe, to, maybe talk about it after 12. I think this is, I know he's a bit of a lemon and, he, and the partridge is strong in him. But and, and there might be an explanation for this not being as obnoxious as it originally appears. But I'm going to play you Richard Madeley asking a British Palestinian member of the British Parliament whether or not her family gave her a heads up on a terror attack last weekend. And, and, I, and I'm going to need a lot of convincing. That wouldn't be like asking me if I knew anything about that IRA bombing last month. There wasn't an IRA bombing last month, thank God. But you, you take my point. They have more and more people coming to the church because you seek sanctuary in a church. That's that's what you do. And, you know, to the why don't they just move? Because I'm thinking to myself, why, when you know that something's coming, why don't you move? Mm. And then to hear, well, actually, they have nowhere to go to. And mm. remember, there's no way to communicate with other people in, in Southern Ghana. So what are you meant to because do? You haven't got a car. There's no, there's no phone battery. Mm. So you can't get in a car. They're too frail anyway, one of them. Um, and they're there as, as a family unit. So I'm hearing what's happening from them through uh, one of the sisters who is the cousin of my mother. So my, my immediate family is in the West Bank. They're in Jerusalem, Ramallah and, and Jericho. Thank goodness so far they are very scared about what comes next and they're fine. But this extent, this pocket of the extended family, we are desperately, desperately worried Gaza about. Needs to stop Your now. family connections uh, in Gaza. Uh, did, did you have any indication of what was going to happen uh, 10 days ago, two weeks ago? Was there any, any word on the street? In Not. Gaza? That's absolutely extraordinary. I, 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 well, anyway, I, there we are. I just, I don't know what the, um, what the corollary of that would be. Do you know what I mean? The counterfactual. If you were talking to a, 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 a Jewish a British Jewish MP, a British Israeli MP. What would the question? What question could Richard Madeley ask that would be as crass and as inappropriate as what he just asked Layla Moran? I can't. I can't think actually. Um, I've got another Layla. I presume it's a different Layla in Archway. Layla, what would you like to say? <clears throat> well, just hearing that um, Richard, Richard Madeley talking, yeah. he's just racist. Simple as fact, and his mouth slipped. Life on there today. There's no other excuse for that. There might be. He might just be very stupid. No, it's not. Um, well, he, he, he might I have thought know. there's so many people getting ready to attack Israel that people in Gaza must have known something about it. Maybe. It, it, but anyway, why how dare you come on this programme and uh, put, put me in a position of trying to defend Richard Madeley? I just, I, I think reaching quite so robustly for the word racist just, just, just spooked me a little, Layla. But you carry on telling me why you rang in. Okay, so I rang in, uh, James, sorry. Mm. James, I James rang not in Richard. Today. Definitely because not Richard. I'm a black British Muslim woman, right? right? Yeah. And, and I'm also a mental health worker. So mm. the last few days, well, since the Hamas attack on Israel on the weekend, last weekend, mm. I went through a hundred different emotions. Every other day, there's a different emotion coming on yeah. to the point where I had to ask family, friends and you know myself as well to switch off the TV, switch off the news every now and then and just sort of not listen to all of this negative and, you know, both sides, people being killed. Yeah. I think your question with where religion plays in terms of that part of the world um there's obviously there's a context of history yeah. and it goes many hundred years back which you know i'm don't really know that much extent sure. of that history in that part of the world but from what i'm seeing today i think in terms of the reaction the media the British government in particular as well. There's a lot of conscious racism towards the people from Gaza in regards to their ethnicity, being from an Arab background, and also being Muslims. And this, you know, with Islam in particular, that name since 9-11 mm. has been associated with terrorism, 
and every single negative thing you can actually think of in the world. Um, so I think when I'm hearing on LBC a lot of Israeli voices, yes. and that's not a bad thing. I like to know what they're going through, what their experience is. Um, but I would also like to hear a lot more voices from people from Gaza in particular. Yes. You know, whether they live in Gaza or they're, you know, they're Palestinians that live outside. So, so would I. So would I. Yeah. But I think in regards to just the reaction, the world's reaction to what's happening, there is conscious racism, Islamophobia towards these people. And my heart just breaks for them. And I'm, I'm not really sure what the solution is. I would love to say everyone sit down. Let's have a you know conversation. Let's try to negotiate things. Let's try to come to a middle ground. Because if, we, if we're going to peel back the layers, everyone is bi- has biases, you know, in terms of what side you, you're kind of mm. leaning yourself towards. And everyone has their own perspective of what's going on, you know. In regards to Hamas being a terrorist organization, um, some people would say, actually, you know, one man's terrorism is another man's freedom fighter. They would. So we all have our own perspective, but that does not, that's not going to help what's happening in Gaza. It's not going to help what's happening in Israel. And we can say, you know, religion does this and religion does that, but actually, if we just take religion out of the equation, you know, every child that's being killed, there's a mother out there crying today. I hear you know, you. I've just heard on the news the 13 year old Israeli girl that was yeah. kidnapped and now being murdered. You know, how's that family feeling? And then you look at the other side. How is the other family, all these other Gazan children being killed and, as well? And that seems, uh, you're taking me right up to the news, Leila. Sorry, I, I guess I, I sense you haven't quite finished, but that, that is where we begin and end. Uh, on so many mornings at the moment, with with that, what seems so obvious to so many um, is 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 out of reach to others. Just that simple fact that you, you all move towards a place where every every child's life is equal, and then the question of who is prepared to take those lives assumes a slightly different complexion. Um, Layla, thank you. It is we, we, we're going to talk about prison sentences next. I think, which I suppose in the con text it almost feels like light relief it's 12.01 five minutes after 12 is the time do you know they're banning glue traps for rats in uh, in wales so there are there are fears that the consequences could be catastrophic in the words of one pest controller there will be rats the sides of cats running free in the streets i hope he's wrong because uh, otherwise we might have to turn our attention. I, I used to do phone-ins about rats quite regularly because it was almost like a form of masochism. I used to be quite phobic. I don't think I am anymore. But um, you'd tell me your stories of rat infestations and I would sit, I, I would sit here literally kind of quivering in, in horror. But, um, but I, I, don't, I don't think that would work anymore. Anyway, don't worry. I don't know why I've told you that. I'm not talking about it now. I'm talking about something completely different. I would like to confine, if I can... And this might be tricky, actually, thinking that we've just come off the back of two fairly heavy hours. But I'd like to con- con- find the coming conversation to people who've been to prison for short amounts of time. I, even as I say those words out loud, I'm not sure how big the constituency is of people that I'm talking to. That there are two ways of looking at a story that is a little bit remarkable. Actually, there are three. So it was announced yesterday by a justice minister called Greg Chalk, I think. Alex Chalk, beg your pardon. Um, Where did I get Greg from? That prisoners, even if they've committed quite serious crimes, prisoners who are not deemed to be much of a risk to the public are going to be released early because the prisons are full. So they need to free up some space to put the new convicts in. And in order to do that, they're going to let out some of the older convicts earlier than they would otherwise have been let out. Now, I'm not sure yet what the phone-in is on this, but have you ever heard anything more mad in your life? I'm, I'm not a hang em, flog em, tabloid twerp, right? And, and I think that prison as punishment is fairly silly instead of prisoners' rehabilitation being a way of making the population safer and, and the country nicer. But neither am I naive, neither am I some sort of touchy-feely 
muesli muncher. Nothing wrong with muesli, by the way. But I, I, I certainly don't believe in the, the, no justice and no, no punishment. But whatever your perspective is on prison, this is the worst of all imaginable worlds. Because if you think that we imprison too many people, right, then freeing up more spaces to imprison more people is a bad thing. If you think that we don't imprison enough people or that sentences aren't long enough, you are probably a contender for Idiot's Corner, but you could have been a member of any of the last six or seven governments going all the way back to Tony Blair. Then this is going to be awful because they're letting people out. And I, th that element of it, I guess, is, is perhaps the most inflammatory, but I'm not sure it's the most interesting. I think Ken Clark did this, and I know that David Gork, a, a former Justice Secretary, has called for it. He, he wanted a ban on all sentences under six months, partly to ease the pressure, but largely because they are completely pointless. And I just don't know whether that is true or not. And I've got absolutely no way of knowing. You know, the more I do this job, the more I feel qualified to comment on the more topics that we do together. Because sometimes you don't need lived experience if you've spoken to loads of people with it. But there are still, um, I should, as ever, make it clear, I'm speaking specifically about England and presumably Wales. The situation in Scotland is, is different for reasons that I might invite someone to ring in and tell me, actually, but not, not yet, because I want to get the conversation well established. you got the chairman of the Prisons Association saying yesterday there is no room left at the inn. Oh, Christmas comes around earlier every year, doesn't it? There's no room left at the inn. We've been overcrowded for decades through successive governments. Nobody wanted to deal with it. And now we find ourselves, after 13 years of Tory rule, with no space at all. There are fewer than 600 spaces left in the entire prison estate and fewer than 150 in men's prisons. I'll tell you one thing for nothing. However bad it is, if the criminal justice system was operating at anything like an acceptable level, it would be infinitely worse. Because the number of people that haven't come to trial, the number of cases that haven't come to trial, or the number of sentencings that haven't actually been handed down yet, they're off the charts. So even with a busted flush of a criminal justice system, the prisons are full to bursting. What's to be done? Somebody suggested yesterday they would put porter cabins in prison yards and have what could be loosely described as pop-up prison cells. Now, the phrase pop-up is normally re applied to restaurants and shops. You have a pop-up shop where you haven't taken out a permanent lease on the place, but in order to uh, accommodate, you know, a, a property development or a, or a holiday season, you pop up or you're a restaurateur and you're not ready to go all in yet, the investment involved. So you kind of do a, you do an almost camping style setup. You have a pop-up restaurant. Pop-up prison cells. So there's two things there already. You've got prisoners be who've done big, bad crimes being released in order to free up space for new prisoners. Only about 18 days early, but still, it's early. You've got pop-up prison cells being put up in prison uh, yards. And, and everyone's sort of sitting around after 13 years of Tory rule, completely ignoring the fact that this lot are normally the ones that are banging on about what a great job they're going to do in the context of law and order. It's another morning where everything feels slightly comical, doesn't it? And of course, Suella Braverman, as, as, uh, as Fella points out, is constantly making announcements about the latest bunch of people that she wants to lock in jail for waving the wrong flag, or not in the case of a Hamas flag, but right, waving a Palestinian flag or waving something... Yeah, you know, or saying something that she finds of not lock them up, lock them. How are you going to lock them up for that if you're letting murderers out early, albeit only 18 days early? But that's just another mark of the madness that we currently inhabit, I think, isn't it? Just sitting here. What are you being told to get angry about at the moment? I, I find it so hard to keep up when you've got something going on like the situation in Gaza, the usual bogus culture war invitation. I know you're supposed to be furious with the BBC about something or other, but but what are the other invitations? Is it transgender toilets back in the game yet? Are you supposed to be getting furious about transgender toilets? I went to a transgender toilet the other day and I, I came out of the cubicle I was at the theatre, I was watching a rather splendid show at the, the Lyric Theatre in Hammersmith called The Empress. And I came out of the, the toilet and I thought I'd made a terrible mistake. 
Because every it was, it was full of ladies, and I'm using the word ladies in the context of toilets because they're usually called the ladies, and and it was you know women were doing their makeup in the mirror and having a bit of a natter, and I thought I honestly thought I'd made a terrible mistake and I'd actually gone into the ladies by accident. I was the only bloke in there, so I was washing my hands. I, I, I didn't feel uncomfortable, except in so far as I thought I might have gone into the wrong facilities. But it, it did sort of um, remind me that it's been a while since anyone was trying to terrify us about the existence of um, um, non-gendered toilets. But I don't know what you're supposed to be getting angry about. But I do know this. The people in the business of making you get angry about the things that you shouldn't be getting angry about. Oh, the barges. How did we get a oh, thank you guy in Torquay? Reminds us. They've forgotten about the barges because it all went horribly wrong. Sola Braverman just moves on to something else. Rwanda. Barges. Barges. There's no people on the barges yet. And we're paying millions of quids in order to keep them floating around. But the people who are constantly telling you to get angry about things that you shouldn't be getting angry about, they should be telling you to get flipping furious. Surely. About prisoners being released from prison early. And about pop-up prison cells in prison yards. I mean, what do we pay these people for? Politicians, I mean, not prison officers. We barely pay them at all, which is, of course, a huge part of the problems that the Tories have presided over for the last 13 years. But that's not what I want to talk to you about either. I don't want to do the systemic problems. Jack, um, I've been in touch to uh, give you a quick idiot's guide to what, what, they, may, what they may be. Um, I don't, I, we've done the systemic problem. Why are our prisons full? And we, we understand some of the answers to that. But what I want to talk about is the efficacy, I quite like that word, the effectiveness, if you prefer, of short prison sentences. So I am going to say less than a year. Alex Chalk yesterday suggested that jail sentences of less than a year will be scrapped for most criminals under government plans to tackle the prison's overcrowding crisis. This puts the Conservative government, who are historically incredibly keen to lock people up for all sorts of offences, including climbing bridges uh, in a protest against the lethargic response to climate change. We'll all have favourites of people we don't think should have been locked up. But this puts the actual Tories, no wonder it's relegated to a tiny little nib at the bottom of the front page of the Telegraph. This puts the actual Tories in the position of not being able to send wrongans to jail anymore. Uh, successive governments pursuing policies designed to delight tabloid idiots tabloid editing idiots who are constantly banging on about prisons being like butlins. It's, it's all their fault that the political response to that ludicrous, ridiculous, half-brained rhetoric has been to send more and more and more and more people to jail. And now there aren't enough jail cells to cope with all the people being sent to jail by politicians desperate to appease tabloid editing idiots. So what's the response? Well, we're not going to send people to jail at all. It's almost impossible to think of a more symmetrical example of stupidity at a political and media level. I, I, I can't believe it didn't happen in time to make my new book, which is largely about the conjunction of stupidity at a political and media level, although there's a fat side order of malevolence as well, and the malevolence of the tabloid editing idiots banging on about prisons being like holiday camps and insisting that people get locked up for less and longer has completely created a situation in which the prisons are all full. And how did the right-wing government respond to it? By not sending people to prison at all. But that's not what I want to talk about either. What I want to talk about is a short prison sentence and whether it worked. Ideally on you, but given the limitations of this genre, I will accept testimony from you if it is someone that you know. Do, do short prison sentences, and I'm going to say prison sentences of less than a year, do they do good? Do they do more harm than good? Do they do nothing at all? Or do they do anything? So you have been to prison. It has been less than a year to which you were sentenced, which means I don't need, you do not need to tell me what you were imprisoned for, although my natural curiosity will kick in and I will want to know, as will most people listening, but you don't have to tell us if you really don't want to. I'd rather you did. I guess it's kind of going to be relevant to the question of reoffending, isn't it? But a prison sentence of less than 12 months, does it do anything. 03456060973 is the number you need. So what sort of crimes get people sent down for less than 12 months? And 
what does a sentence of that sort of length actually achieve? And you are allowed to answer absolutely nothing, James. 03456060973. Give me a call now. You will get through. It's 12.17. 20 minutes after 12 is the time. And um, it's absolute madness. Absolute madness. The... Uh, state of prisons and the criminal justice system in general. But we live in such a weird country now that all of the print media, which of course sets the agenda for much of the public discourse, it can't really do anything. It's brought in Brexit, it brought in Boris Johnson, it's championed people like Peter Bone, and the people that they've put in charge for the last 13 years have presided over a decline and collapse in almost every single aspect of our, of our country. And, of course, the, the people you rely upon to hold the politicians accountable or to report reality to, you can't because they've been completely complicit in the chaos and catastrophe that the country has had imposed upon it. But, hey-ho, on we go. Luke's in Letchworth to talk about short prison sentences. Luke, what happened? Uh, well, uh, where do I start? So I was a 20-year-old young lad yep. on a night out with a group of friends and got to the point of being so drunk, I didn't know what was going on, basically. Yeah. And a group of my friends got into an altercation with other other groups, or with another group, and me being myself got involved. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, at the time, I had a bottle of beer in my hand. Oh, dear. So you bottled yeah. someone? Well, not in the typical action you would think of. No, I didn't have the bottle by the neck of the, of, you know, of right. the drink. Yeah. I was had it as you would drink it. Okay. Um, and my initial reaction was to, to punch, Ooh. unfortunately. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what happened. And then obviously because of the person's injuries, nothing, nothing serious happened to him other than a, a few cuts. Yeah. Um, sorry, it's bringing back a few emotions from, oh, from when it happened. Of course it is. Um, yeah. Oh, obviously I was, you know, young, drunk and stupid, but yeah. So I was sentenced to six months in prison. GBH. GBH. Yeah. Without intent. Um, okay. so yeah, I was sentenced to six months. Of which I only served a month and a half. Okay. Um, yeah, and I, I ended up all over the country in, in just a small month, month really? and a half. I was there. Ended up in Birmingham and Liverpool. Bearing in mind I'm from uh, London, I don't know how that happened. Um, and yeah, so but back to the question, I guess. I yeah. I, I, I I learned my lesson from that. That's interesting. From that short short stint in jail. So you, you 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 would have got into fights quite routinely. It it did happen quite a lot, yeah. And then, I, I and then after going to jail, you never got into fights again. Never, ne never since. This was fifteen years ago. This happened. Oh. I I have never been in an altercation since with anyone. Do you think you needed uh, to go to jail? Do you think a I'd GBH go. conviction, the experience of going to court, the experience of having your parents sitting in the public gallery with that look on their face and maybe a relationship break or whatever. Do you think it needed jail? Uh, I guess in hindsight, yes. Okay. Because it did stop me and my friends from doing what we were doing. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I guess I did need that. Not that I was... Can you remember you know, the first I, morning you woke up? Yeah, I remember it. I, I remember it like yesterday. Tell me about first it. first morning. Tell me about it. In prison or when yeah. the night I got... Uh, well, actually, the, the both I was thinking of, but, but pr pr prison in particular... The first night in prison was scary. Oh. I remember walking in and it was that stereotypical, oh, look, there's fresh meat coming in comment. Yikes. And I was only 20, I was 19 at the time, never been in trouble before, mm. never, not even had a run in with the police. So, yeah. And then the next morning, they basically say, you're going on to the, the wing, as, as they call it, yeah. to the, where all the, you know, other people are with all the, experienced yeah. prisoners, I guess you could say. Yeah, and then, I mean, I, I just can't, I think the, sorry, Jane, I'm a bit nervous. Take your time. Take all the time you want, seriously. Yeah, I mean, I listen to every day and Thank actually speaking to you is a bit, a bit scary. Um, <laughs> you're a yeah. You did my partner's head in. Um, <laughs> sorry. They'll learn. Say that. They'll learn. <laughs> yeah, so the first day was awful. I mean, you're banged up for 23 hours a day, off the day, uh, is with a complete stranger. 
so what, as a nineteen-year-old. What? What? Yeah, I can get. I can feel the fear. Like, I really can, and the confusion. And the, so, what was it that worked? Do you think was it prisons just so rubbish? There's no way I'm going to run the risk of going back. Or was it such a shock to your system that you changed course? Prisons are rubbish. I mean, they are over. What well, they were overcrowded. This well, it's is going worse back now, isn't it? Well, yeah, exactly. It's even worse than what it was. I mean, at one point there was three of us in a holding cell. I don't think that that was meant to be. No, the amount it wasn't built for that. Um, no, not at all. And the facilities obviously were very run down. But I guess. That's what they have to be because they're trying to teach you a lesson, aren't they? I don't know. I mean, every prison is going to be different, aren't they? But you would, you would never. But from the sounds of it, you were never really at risk of being a reoffender. You learnt, you learnt, you short, 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 learnt your lesson. There's no way I'm going back there. If if you were coming exactly. in and out of prison regularly, then it wouldn't be working, would it? The the the, the, poor, no. the poor conditions or whatever it would be, wouldn't be working. I mean, six weeks. It's not a lot, is it? But it was enough. Exactly, and the frustrating thing with it was, after the month and a half, I came out on the electronic tag. Oh, yeah. And so I, I somehow still had my job after going. I, was, I know, I was very fortunate. Um, and I would, I would start work very early in the morning, and I would always ring the, whoever the person was on the other end of the phone yeah. and say, look, I'm going to work yeah. within the time limits they gave me. But one morning, I must have left literally two minutes early to go right. to work and I'd, every day I'd ring them and say look I'm leaving going to work can you please record it and I was like yeah no problem the very next morning three police cars out the front I was back to prison for another month oh really and for breach of your licence yeah and I was like but it's, I, I'm not you know I'm, I am I rung up I thought I was doing the correct thing in telling you but no I went back to prison for so in total it was two, two and a half months got you okay well I suppose rules are rules yeah. will be their defence but but you but yeah. you gave up Probably. fighting at this well, did you did you give up drinking to to, to, to oblivion as well or did you, did to, you to the point of being where you would get where you, yeah. you would just wade into a fight is, and, and that yeah. was that was enough to put you off I, that, I guess that is it isn't it that is a, that's an, so under this legislation you would not be jailed and therefore you would get into another fight next weekend and it could end much much more horribly than the the one that you actually got jailed for luke thank you mate give my love to your partner it's 27 minutes after 12 Catherine's in kendall Catherine, what would you like to say oh hello james hello, Catherine. uh yeah it's really interesting listening to your lad just now um and yeah maybe it depends on the sentence i i'm at the other end of the spectrum um, i'm a retired teacher and a 73 year old grandmother and I have been um, in prison three times now for climate protest. Um, oh. one, uh, a, a week, um, t- twice on remand, one week. Um, this is all within the last, just over a year, I think. The first time was September last year. Oh, I was in remand for a week. And then I was, last November, I was on remand for uh, six and a half weeks. Um, and I could have been there for six months, but my sentencing for that or my trial i should say not my sentencing my trial is not actually now until 2025 um and how does that how does that bit work you're on remand and then the trial gets put back and so they let you out yeah well they can't keep you for more than six months is that the rule and also um so i wasn't uh, exaggerating when i said that if the criminal justice system was operating efficiently then the current problems with overcrowding would be off the charts yes Yes. I mean, I, it, it, it was, I, was, I was denied on the six-week time. I was denied bail. Uh, there were a, a number of us, uh, about 50 of us were actually put on... Uh, no, not 50. The 50 of us did about the action and about um, 20, 25 of us were put on remand, which, I mean, it's such a waste of, of space. Well, except, um, except that, that you, presumably the court or the, uh, the authorities decided that if they didn't put you, if they didn't lock you up, you'd go out and do another protest. Um, uh, very likely, yes. yes. Um, and and <laughs> in fact, the last, um, the two weeks I did um, back in April was after um, a sentencing, a sentencing where um, I told the judge that um, I couldn't not go out and protest. He wanted us to say that we weren't going to protest again, um, and I can't do that. That would be a lie because with the climate crisis as it is, um, I'm I'm much more scared of the 
consequences for my grandchildren. I mean, I know you're very conversant with this, as should all of us be. Um, I'm much more scared of that than I am actually of a prison prison sentence. But it was very interesting in prison because there were so many women there who should not have been there. They were on short term, a lot of the time quite short term. Quite a lot of them, I think, rather... um, What's the name of your the the young man um, you had on before me? Um, oh, anyway, he was Luke, saying he was Luke, recalled. Luke, it was Luke in Luke, Letchworth. Yeah, yes. as Luke was saying, you know, again, this electronic tag. I know friends who have been on electronic tags and they failed. One woman was arrested for being in her garden because it was it was um, showing on her tag that she wasn't in her house. It's like you GPS, know, they, isn't it? And we've all got GPS things. I've got to try and keep track of my children using a GPS and sometimes you haven't got a clue. It gives you a very, very rough idea of where they are. It doesn't. It's not specific yeah. enough to be confident enough to lock someone back. So you're a grizzled old con, really, Catherine. Uh, uh, well, yes, you know, you could say that. <laughs> um, but, you know, as I say, I mean, it, 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 it doesn't put... it. You know, but, 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 but this, you're, you're a particular case as well, because this is a cause. Your cause is... Your, 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 your belief in your yeah, cause is so I like, strong. I don't like the word cause and beliefs because, um, you know, we're in a climate crisis. It's no, not a OK, cause. you're... you're, it, you're, you know. you're, you're uh, Matt, know, your, 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 your fear about science is such mm. that, that that it dwarfs any fear of of a prison. How do your family yeah. feel about your frequent incarcerations? If you don't um, mind me asking. Well, my my I I live um, I live um, in a in a little annex at my daughter's. They're very supportive. Are they? I've got my two grandchildren, um, eleven and seven. Yeah, they are. They're, they're, I mean, because they understand. And do um, they come and, and visit grandma in jail? Uh, well, again, as Luke was saying, yes. um, I live in Kendal. I was down um, South London oh. because they will they will send you to a prison nearest to the court where you are sentenced. So you know uh, there there are prisons up this way, but that would be you know that they will send you to the nearest, take you to the nearest one. So no, I was way down south, and uh, well, I never. Um, and, and uh, I mean, so not coming to trial until 2025, I sense there's a chart. I don't know what you're allowed and not allowed to say to me on the radio. Don't get me into trouble. I'm not as comfortable as you are going to jail. My kids need shoes. What, um, I sense that you might reoffend, Catherine. Um, there's always a possibility, yes. <laughs> there's always a possibility. <laughs> um, I, might, I might let a few of these go. But, you know, all we need is the government to do what it should be doing. Yeah. We would not be out there. This is a ridiculous thing, it's isn't it? Yes, I it mean, is. you know, it's so, it's so scary. It's so scary. You know, and the fact now, I mean, 350 people um, outside the, uh, in London today protesting, correct, including yeah. Greta. Yes. Um, you know, and they're, they're well, Some of them are probably going to get locked up as well. I, I don't know. We'll catch up with Henry Riley perhaps about what's been going on down there. Catherine, thank you. I was not expecting a call from a 73-year-old retired teacher who has done bird, but um, but I'm so glad you were listening today. Thank you. Uh, and there it is. I mean, you know, the question of whether those sentences are going to have any impact whatsoever upon um, Catherine's likelihood to reoffend has answered itself. 12.33, Amelia Cox has your headlines. It is 12.37. You are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. A little bit of mea culpa from me. James, regarding your guy with the beer bottle, quotes, nothing much happened to him, just a few cuts, end quotes. The ignorance of how he may have impacted the other person forever. I bet they remember it. As a trauma worker, that guy could do with some awareness training. But what a laugh you had together. What about the fear? Jeez. That's an excellent point, and I apologise. I, I shouldn't have... Uh, let that pass from Luke. I should have imagined what it would be like to be on the receiving end of a smack in the head with a beer bottle and what it might do to your um, uh, confidence and your mental health. So thank you for for pulling me up on that and I I, I will do better. Uh, Catherine, however, has come in for almost universal praise. even from people who don't consider themselves to be particularly uh, concerned about climate change. Um, uh, And, of course, the... the, uh, the other side of that would be what a waste of prison space. An interesting message from a magistrate. As a magistrate, uh, it's his, uh, our hat from Liz, our hands are tied. A young person who loves driving is in court after stealing a car. It's a 20th offence. All previous fines, which he can't afford to pay, haven't been paid. Community orders haven't worked. We've taken all previous offences and into account and we have to jail them for a short period of time. They then come out and do it all again, leading to more crime and more fines, more criminality. 
Uh, we shouldn't reward crime, but if I had the power to do so, I'd put in a community order which involves something to do with cars and see if we could turn their interest into, um, into legal pursuits. And I'm surprised to hear such black and white thinking from you. If Luke hadn't been sent to prison, he could have had community duties, probation liaison, help reducing his alcohol intake. It's not a binary choice. It's not prison or nothing. That's a very good point as well, which um, which needed to be made. Uh, Siobhan is in Gravesend. Siobhan, what would you like to say? Hi, thanks Hello. for having Hello. me on again. You're very welcome. Um, I'm actually really nervous, whereas the first time, ironically, I wasn't. But oh. It's an emotive subject. It's, it's, yes. it's actually... a it's not about me, it's it's my husband. Okay. Um so in I met him in two thousand and previous to that he'd been on remand for a a, a violent offence. Okay. It's quite horrible actually. Um and it was absolutely related to his alcoholism. Right. Um and I was quite in quite a vulnerable situation when I met him. Yeah. Anyway, he ended up receiving uh, a prison sentence in 2001 for drink driving. Right. Um, and it was his third offence. Um, and, it, you know, it was acknowledged by the court that he did have a problem with alcohol, even yes. though he was in his in his mid-20s. Right. So he he did two months um, at Elmley Prison on the um, Isle of Sheppey. Yeah. Um, place so I'd never want to visit again sure. um, and there were no uh, no steps taken to address the alcoholism even um, after the there's a period of probation afterwards the weekly see a probation officer and you know that was that was never addressed yeah. um, so fast forward almost exactly 20 years we did we did separate right. uh, in 2008 although we never divorced because the domestic violence was would have put me at, at, at a huge risk to have divorced him. Oh, um, in 2021, unfortunately, he had been... Oh. God, I don't want to be graphic, but he had been dead in his flat for a week over Christmas. Oh, um, uh, From alcoholism, because he just he just spiralled after that. And it's interesting, the point you made from the text earlier, you know, there is, it's either a... It's either a sentence yeah. or, you know, a, a, some sort of community order that, that not not necessarily relative to the problems that you're experiencing. Um, but it would be, it would be, uh, you know, you know how it'd get treated in a tabloid by by some sort of idiotic columnist about oh, soft touch being done for drink driving and they're sending him on a course, you know. Uh, but it would just have helped. Yeah. I mean, it couldn't have had a worse consequence, could it, than doing nothing. No, actually, I used to uh, manage a children's home, and one of our children there has recently been convicted of of murder. Uh, he did serve a short sentence for, um, you know, just well, it sounds silly, but repeated silly offences. Yes. And the judge in the end got really annoyed, and he he went to prison for a couple of months. Right. Uh, anyway, in twenty twenty one, actually, he. He murdered a 15-year-old boy outside Woolwich Station. And if you knew this young boy's past, yeah. um, I, I cannot tell you what the access to these children's files looks like. It, no. It's harrowing what they've been through. And there's no interest um, whatsoever in that, is there? In in, in tra because I, Is it trauma-induced prison? Is that what it's called? You, you, you might know more about it than I yeah. do. Yeah. I've been the reading same about with my the, husband. Yeah, was you know a, a childhood of trauma. Of, um, I did try to ring up actually about um, adverse childhood experiences because I I have also been through that, but fortunately took a different path path, and I and I, and I don't think that makes me a better person. You know, it's just no, 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 no. It, it's just life is a game of chances, and I think that you know if other opportunities happen if maybe if I hadn't got pregnant before. Um, in my gap year and <laughs> things like that. If ifs and buts were pots and pans, like Siobhan, there'd be no need of tinkers. <laughs> somebody exactly, wants to say. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to see what we call in care, you know, some person centeredness when, when people are being sentenced, yeah. you know. Yeah, I don't, well, I, and, and there it is, you know, a short short prison sentence, even long prison sentences in some case, having no real impact whatsoever on either recidivism or rehabilitation. So to what purpose? You, in the case of violent crime, of course, you, you need some form of restorative justice as, alongside 
um, uh, the victim, the, the punishment that society imposes to ensure that that kind of behavior is, is, is a deterrent. People are deterred from it. But so much of the rest of it, Siobhan, you touch on. It's called trauma-informed prison. I knew that I'd, I'd been reading about it. The Center for Crime and Justice Studies have done some some research into it. And that that is a sort of institutional violence as the systemic reproduction of oppressive policy and practice. And it's interesting, Siobhan mentions a children's home because... Uh, housing children in unregulated accommodation or releasing people from prison with no fixed abode um, can all contribute to this. And the idea that you can actually reduce prison spaces by understanding trauma better, it, it would be fairly straightforward if it wasn't for tabloid editing idiots. Thank you, Siobhan. I, d I don't know. Is the word tinkers politically incorrect? If it is, I wholeheartedly apologize for deploying it. It is now quarter to one. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation, Mystery Hour with James O'Brien. It is three minutes after 12 and it is time for Mystery Hour, like the man said, and it is your weekly opportunity to achieve the sort of satisfaction not ordinarily available anywhere else on the radio. People ring, look, it doesn't sound amazing if you're new to it, I say. People ring in with questions and other people ring in with answers. But not only is it incredibly... Well, I hope it's not that entertaining today. Is that bad? Can we do a very serious mystery hour so that my rib doesn't hurt and you make me laugh? Or, God forbid, that I laugh at my own jokes, as has occasionally been known. There is usually a guarantee, as Keith has just... Thank you, Keith. I normally like to guarantee that you will have at least one laugh-out-loud moment between 12 o'clock and 1 o'clock on a Thursday, but I'm, I'm not sure I'm capable of a laugh-out-loud moment. At the, at, at the moment. I, we shall, so let's try and not make it one of the very silly and frivolous mystery hours, OK? Let's try and make it a bit more serious. Like that's ever going to work. I think we'll crack straight on. Don't forget the board game. Um, I was looking at some of the reviews last night. It's about four and a half stars on, um, on Amazon, and there's loads of them there. And what you have to remember is anything I sell on Amazon, you get a few racists turning up to claim that it's awful, even though they probably can't really read books or, or, or understand the rules of the incredibly simple Mystery Hour board game. So you can probably give yourself another half a star for, 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 for that at least. But it's, it's a brilliant game, and you can get your own copy at mysteryhour.co.uk. Or... You can win it by being my favourite contributor, which this week will involve not making me laugh. I can safely say that I don't think I'll be giving the Mystery Hour ball game this week to the person who makes me laugh the most. Um, full terms and conditions are available at lbc.co.uk. It's five minutes after 12. Uh, David is in Surbiton. David, question or answer? Uh, I've got a question, Jim. Carry on. Um, the question is, it's about national anthems. Right. Uh, and I wondered, is the UK the only country in the world which has a national anthem which is dedicated to a living individual? Why did you and, say and living? Are you, I won't make you laugh well, because I'm a very boring person. No, you're not, David. Not at all. Did, did, I mean, you're almost making me laugh there, which I suspect was your intention, wasn't it? No, not me. Uh, um, uh, you said living with yep. qu quite a bit of emphasis. It suggests that you know of an anthem that praises a dead person. No, it, it doesn't. Oh. Uh, I, I don't know. But I can imagine circumstances. Uh, for example, let's take maybe Turkey. Turkey. Where uh, the most famous person in their history is Ataturk. Yes. the founder of the nation. So I could envisage oh, I see their what national you mean. anthem yes, being based around okay. that. Yes. But so our, the, our glorious founder almost, our glorious whatever. It, exactly. So is there um, another national anthem that praises... A, a living person is the question. A head of state is probably the... I mean, what, what about other royal families? Do they not have national anthems that praise the head of the royal family? Um, the reason I'm asking the question, James, is Thailand. I don't have a clue. Thailand. I bet you Thailand. And Thailand have... Uh, yep, they, could they, be. They imbue their king with um, religious significance, uh, like yeah, as in like a demigod. So that might, yeah, well, anyway, the point is, I don't know, and nor do you. So that's why you're asking. Yep. Thank you. Do any other countries have a national anthem which praises or or is simply dedicated to a living person? It doesn't may not be praising it. Maybe saying he's a right old wrong and we can't believe it. I'm glad he's dead. That kind of thing. No, living person, living. Twelve oh seven is the time. Bo's in Bridgend. Bo, question or answer? 
A uh, question, please, James. Carry on. Um, why don't you ever see a uh, seagull in a tree? That sounds like the first line of a joke, though. No, no. Why? I, I've done due diligence here, you know, and uh. I've, I've, the outbuildings on the floor in a sparsely, but never in a tree. Never seen a seagull in a tree. I don't know if I've ever seen a seagull. It sounds like a George Formby song no, now. Yeah, but you, you I've sing this now. I've never seen a seagull in a tree. I've no, never seen a seagull in a tree. I've never seen a seagull. I've never seen a seagull. Oh, no, you're right. Oh. Uh, Jim, if I was, I'm about 15 miles from the coast here, okay? Yeah. Now, if, 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 I, if I'm a seagull, I'm thinking, right, I'm off down to the coast now to steal some chips, okay? Yeah. So I've got 15 miles to go. Surely I'm going to need a whiff and stop somewhere. You'll have a little rest. In a tree. Yeah. Yeah. A handy, a handy not, spot. Well, I, I, think, I think you're sort of probably in the process of answering the question yourself. So se- seagulls... Well, I don't know. Well, they, they, they live on cliffs, don't they? They roost on cliffs, and they, they're for buildings that can deputise for cliffs. They will stop on. So it's probably got something to do with pre- predation. So they don't like trees. But they will yeah, well, rest on I, you a... You know, I live, I live on a lot of junk food, but if I'm hungry, I'm going to have a salad, don't I? You well, but you, you go, there's buildings. You're not, they're not, they don't find themselves in areas where there aren't any places to stop. So, so really, you're saying they haven't got the intelligence to think, oh, I'm quite tired, you're landing on a lovely branch over there, landing on a tree. I, I don't know if it's in... intelligence. I, th- I, don't, I think they don't like the cover. I think they like to be able to see clearly. Or, or, uh, that's what, actually, that's why they're called seagulls. Because they need to be able to see clearly in front of them and they can't have any leaves or trees getting in the way. I can see clearly now the trees are gone. Also, haven't they got webbed feet? I've no idea how a seagull... Uh, I think, no, they've got, I think that's they? your how, answer. Where, how, how, would they steal, how would they steal people's food or webbed you feet? Can, you can, that, well, like, I'll show you, Bo. Put the phone down. They've got claws. Put, 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 they've got claws. They haven't got claws. Put me on speaker. What do you mean, put you on put, speaker? Are, are you on the phone line or a landline? Uh, phone line, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, if if you put me on a speakerphone and put your phone down and you were talking to me and I said, right, now hold your fingers together so as you've got webbed hands, right? But how, how do they steal food? Or it's still, you can still pick up a phone. You can still snatch some chips with webbed feet. Well, like like a, like a baseball glove and scoop it up, like. Yeah, no, like two baseball gloves com- like next to each. That would be one way. So the answer is webbed feet. The ants, they don't land in trees because they got web feet. They can't grip the tree. They can only they can only settle on flat surfaces. Oh, James, you're, you're on dodgy ground. You. What do you mean dodgy ground? That's a, that's an obvious well, answer. I, I, well, I don't I, I, I don't agree with your answer. What do you mean you don't agree with my answer? Do seagulls well, have webbed feet? You made that up. You I made did not make feet. that up. I worked it out. You worked it out. I worked it out. Oh, God, I hope there's an, uh, an expert on that, seagulls. That, that, they they, they so. do have webbed feet. That's why they, they swim. That's how they can swim so well. Oh, God, well... You uh, know I'm right. That's why you're, you're embarrassed now. Oh, my God. I'm not embarrassed. You are embarrassed. You should be. I, I'm, not, I'm not convinced of the argument that they got webbed feet. Well, they have got webbed feet. Are you looking at a picture of a seagull there? No. I'm imagining one in my mind's eye. Right. Done with it. Yeah, OK. Then. All right. I, I'm, uh, listen, I, I, that's Alex, why. Alex, Alex, uh, in the interest of getting other people on the show, I'll accept your answer. Well, I, no, you don't have to. Also, they grab your food with their beaks, you prune, not with their feet. No, they don't. They yes, come they feet do. first. They do I, not. I, I, they I, come swooping feet... down and grab it with their mouth. I was down in Beak. Devon and attacked by a Cornwall no more than three weeks ago. This and is and supposed to be... God almighty, this is supposed to be a serious mystery, our boat. You're making me laugh. It's not serious. It's got feet. You can the the, the dense the dense foliage we have now in trees. You can easily land on with webbed feet anyway. Well, that that, all right. I'll leave it on the board then. Why don't seagulls land in trees? Thank you, Bo. But it's because they've got webbed feet. Eleven minutes after twelve is the time. Alex is in Carmarthen. Um, Alex, question or answer? It's an answer, James. Carry on, Alex. Um, I hate to do this to a fellow Welshman, but you're absolutely right about the seagulls. Yeah, there you go. Um, Web feet. Uh, their, their feet are adapted for paddling. Um, their feet don't bend in that manner, so they can obviously land on a flat surface. But to grip a, uh, a branch, which very well may be moving, they, they're just not capable of it. 
So he might as well have asked why you never see a duck in a tree. Exactly the same. Any any, any water bird, they they can't they can't do it. They physically can't do it. A swan. Have you ever seen a swan in a tree? No. Never seen a swan in a tree, Alex. Or a goose. Or never any seen a other... goose in a tree. Never no. seen a gull in a tree. Never no. seen a tern in a tree. You could perhaps some of the wading birds have. Do they have web feet or do they have? I think most most waders have a degree of webbing, but there may be a few. But again, even those you don't you don't not, see them in trees. You're not going to see them in a tree. And again, no. is is it is it true that they steal food with their beaks, not their feet? I think it is true, isn't it? But it's not again, even relevant yeah, to the again, question. Again, they 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 they've got the dexterity yes. to you know to to handle their eggs on cliff tops with their feet. You know, a, a large throat. They don't. Of course, take it their, no, they take it. They take it with their beaks. Yes. Yeah. Um, qualifications. Uh, been a keen amateur ornithologist since I was uh, a member of the RSPB uh, when I was from about eight years old. Oh, lovely! And I, live, a, I live by the coast. I'm so. a member of the RSPB. You know, are you no longer a member of the RSPB? Uh, I think it may have lapsed. Sadly, well, you um, want to sort that out, mate. They need yeah, all the, they need all the help they can get at the moment. I'm a member of the <laughs> RSPB. We've got a family membership. Um, uh, thank you, Alex. Round of applause, please. A lovely answer. So I, I asked. I was just going to do a little bit of a staff meeting now, if that's all right. I specifically said, don't put through silly questions or funny callers. And the second caller was Bo asking why you never see a seagull in a tree. I don't think you're taking my injury very seriously, frankly. <laughs> that made me laugh. Uh, Jackson Ipswich, Jack, question or answer? Hi, it's a question, please. Carry on. Why is one, bar, one side of a bar of soap soft and the other side hard? What? Yeah, so I'm a gardener, yeah. and when I come in from work, my hands are filthy. Right. Um, so I get the bar of soap. It can be a brand new one out of the packet, or it can be on the side. Yeah. Put it under the tap, scratch it. Yeah. So you scratch the softer side to fill your nails up with soap, no. and you get the nail brush and, and give it a jolly good old scrub, and your hands are clean. But there's always the other side of the bar of soap, which is hard, and you can't scratch. It's just, I just don't recognise. What brand of soap do you use? It doesn't matter. Well, it does matter because we use imperial leather and this doesn't happen with <laughs> imperial leather. <laughs> Don't laugh like it, it that. Does. It, it, does it does not. Does. Ow! It does it not. It really does, James. It really does. Even when you go to a hotel and, and you bring back one of those little packets of soap, you know, a little posh one. I don't think this is true. You've just because got one side gets wet. No, it, it can be a brand new bar of soap out of the packet. Honestly, I do it every day, and I often think. Well, I, I mean, I don't. I trust. Ooh. I do trust you. I don't think you're <laughs> yanking my chain, but I think you're. I think you're mistaken. No, I don't think. Let I me. Am. I'm just going to have another staff meeting. All right. Okay. Just, excuse me. Excuse me. Is this, do you recognise this at all? I'd never encountered this, Eleanor. Do you know about this soap? You use soap, surely. Have you got one side hard and one side soft? Have you ever? What? Yes, one side's wet and one side's less wet. No one really recognises the circumstances behind your question, Jack. Wow. Well, well what, maybe. So, what brand? What maybe brand maybe do you use yeah. at the? Oh no, you've already answered that. Well, no, I've got a duff bar upstairs in the bath. Duff. I sometimes just get straight into the bath. Yes. And um, give you know, do my nails there, or uh, uh, the draining board in the utility room. I've just got an Asda. A like bog standard brand of soap, I, and I, I don't think it's doing this thing that you say it's doing when it's straight out of it the really packet. Is. I think it's because it's rested on on yeah. one side yeah. of the. It right. really is. True. Oh, hang on! You've got some support. An unsigned text has come in <laughs> saying it's true, James. Re soap, but there then another go. text came in at the same time and said, "I don't know what she's on about either." Well, maybe you maybe you don't get your hands dirty. Fifty-two forty-eight. No, well, we'll find out for you, Jack. Um, Thank you. <laughs> no, you're, you're very welcome. It's 12.16. It is 12 minutes to one. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Rory Stewart's very good on this. Every time I mention Rory Stewart, I get accused of canonising him or beatifying him, and people send me his voting record from his time in David Cameron's government. So save yourself the effort of doing that. I, I, I am aware that he uh, failed to defy the whips on countless occasions when he went through the lobby in support of pretty grim legislation. But it doesn't mean that his thoughts on prisons as a former minister in that field are worthless or, or, or in, indeed in any way diminished by his performance in other areas. And he's fascinating on this. Carmen's read the um, the book, um, uh, Rory Stewart's latest book, and talks about uh, hor hor horrifying discovery that the majority of prisoners were serving sentences of around a week. 
The Netherlands offers up an interesting model, and they have some of the smallest prison populations in Europe. Sentences allow people to keep a semblance of normal life while doing time. That lessens the burden on the state to provide housing and jobs for ex-cons, because without those things, housing and jobs, they become immediately more likely to re-offend, uh, says Carmen in Surrey. Um, and I, I, I wasn't expressing any sympathy for the drink driver, Jenny. I was expressing uh, sympathy for his widow, uh, for, for Siobhan. And, of course, if he had received uh, proper help and rehabilitation with his alcohol on his first prison sentence, then there would have been a, a much better chance of him not, not re-offending. And if, God forbid, he had killed someone while, while drink driving, the, um, the only way you could have prevented that from happening would have been by giving him help with his alcohol abuse. So I, I, I don't, I don't I think you possibly got the wrong end of my stick on that one. 12.49 is the time. Jake is in Crawley. Jake, what would you like to say? Um, I, I got sent to prison. I did about four months. Right. Um, and then three months on a tag. And um, mine was for desertion from British Army, Crikey. which I felt was pretty pointless when I went because, I mean, it, it, all it were really were deterrent to other people. It, yes. weren't, it didn't really teach me anything other than but they, they, I learnt nothing from it. There was no point to me. Where, to where were you when you deserted? Oh, no, I didn't end up going. So I, I didn't I, I didn't actually turn up for my flight. So I didn't actually go to Afghanistan and then run off in Afghanistan. Um, so you were being deployed to Afghanistan and you went AWOL before the tour started? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I wanted to stay with my missus sort of thing at the time. So I, I saw that I didn't go. I ended up not going. I made a decision not to go. Um, I was AWOL for about three months. And then I got caught, sent back to army. Um... I threat, I basically, there was no way they were getting me to go anyway at that stage because I'd already lost my head. I basically said to him, look, as soon as you give me a rifle, I'm going to make ready and my foot's coming off, so I'm not going. So, it's not happening. Okay. Um, but obviously that, that were a case of them saying, well, fair enough, you'll go to prison. So I, I went to prison. I got sent to Chelmsford. Well, I went to Colchester for five days while they got me out. I had to go to a court first. I had to wait a few months first. I think it was about two months waiting. Yeah. Or maybe maybe about, maybe about four weeks actually waiting. How, how long had you been in the army before you went AWOL? Uh, only eight. I did about eighteen months. To about eighteen months. Right. Um, I started off in Hounslow, then I went over to Belfast. I was based in Belfast for a little bit, and then I went AWOL. I met an AWOL loads of times, though. To be fair, but Why? the last time I did it was you, you, I didn't would, want to be in. Would, would, I didn't want to be in. And you're not allowed to just. You're not allowed to just leave like you can a normal job. Oh no, you can't just you, you can't you not allow like I, I, three months into my training, um, they said to us all before we went on leave, um, you need to make your mind up today, stop in the army. If you don't make your mind up today, you've got four years, you are not getting out sort of things. They did let them, you know, I wanna I wanna go home first, I've got an holiday to file Iraqi books, I wanna go and have have some of my friends and then come back and make my decision while I'm at home. Right. Don't wear like that, you've got to make your mind up now. Um, and I didn't know, so at the time I was thinking, but, but if I'd have stopped in, I have to wait six days for a DOR, which meant I'd have missed me already to file Iraqi. I weren't 100% sure if I wanted to stay or not anyway. Right. Um, so I just said, well, I'm, I, I just stopped in, that way. I, I wanted to go on holiday, so I went on holiday, come back, and I didn't go back to army. And then after... And then they locked they you up. to go back. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so what was prison like? I mean, what, what, so for you, it's a deterrent against other people who are thinking of going AWOL. It's ma, not because you're not yeah, going to reoffend. You're not going to reoffend as a deserter. Do they? T they don't take you back in. I mean, cr crikey, that's just. That's what I mean. There, there were no, there were no learning curve for me because. Well, of course I, I there wasn't. It, it were perfect in a way because I weren't. I were getting out of the army, but doing the sentence was was deterrent to everybody else. It couldn't have possibly taught me a lesson because I couldn't reoffend again because I weren't in the army anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so in my world, I was thinking, well, this is pointless. I, I, I'm not going to reoffend. Like I would reoffend if you let me back, if you kept me in. But you're not even keeping me in. So what, what was the purpose of sentence? your prison sentence? It's quite bizarre, isn't it's, it? It's a deterrent to everybody else. No, I know that. I'm yeah. saying the question rhetorically. From your point of view, it was utterly pointless. From my point of view, there was, no, there was nothing. I couldn't learn anything. No. I, in a way, it was perfect, but it actually caused me a lot of drama. But it were it was perfect for, from the aspect of leaving the army. Right. Um, but obviously. You know, it, 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 weren't, it weren't good, but it, it, you know what I mean? It, How, are it, it How are you getting on now? How are you getting on now? I'm fine now. Good. Sort of, well, well Re most, relatively speaking. Most of the time, anyway. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad to hear it. But Crikey. yeah, I think it was pointless, like, so I don't think they should do that. How do, did you go on the road? Right? Did, you, did you hide when you were AWOL? Were you like... Yeah, you... yeah, yeah, you can't work. I couldn't work free... Well, we're working for Cashin' Hand outside. 
Right. Um, but you can't get a proper job or like that because they get you straight away. Are they, and they're looking for you properly. Is it the red caps that come after you when you're... Is that what they're called, um, the military police? To be fair, mate, when they got me, I, 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 I don't even know how they got me, but they surrounded the house. They were, they, were, they were military police. They were really? police. There were no escape when they got me. I'm so not a get away. They were, they were about 12. I think they were about... I think they were about... I can't remember how many. But I bet there were at least nine, ten of them. Good Lord. And all... I, I, well... <laughs> That's a very, you're very odd. I mean, all the all the calls we've taken. And then today. they had to unarrest me. I could have got away again, but I thought I'll just go and face it. They, when they got me to airport, yeah, they had to unarrest me because they weren't allowed to take a prisoner on. To, it was a normal civilian plane, right? So they had to unarrest me. Which, which, when they unarrested me, they took me cuffs off me. I could have gone then. Well, you could have just um, legged it. I could have just gone, yeah, because I weren't in any cuffs. They, they weren't allowed. You'd be, to you'd be spending the airport. rest of your life so on the. the you'd be airport, spending the rest of your life on the run. Plane, if you know what I mean, which yeah, I did. But you couldn't spend the rest of your life on the run. You'd have to join the A team or something. That's what I mean. That's why I did it. I thought I was yeah, getting out way. Get but, it out the way. Well, yeah. I never. That's a story, isn't it? Yeah, it's a mad one, isn't it? It is a mad one. Well, I'm glad you're doing better now, mate. I really am, and I, I'm, I'm sorry for what you went through. I've got. I mean, every call's been a bit. I, 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 not, I don't know if I was expecting a sort of trend. In the pro- but every single call has been a little bit of a gobsmacker, frankly, today. I, from a 73-year-old grandmother doing regular prison sentences to, to Jake sounding like something out of a, almost of a sort of TV drama or something. I wish you well, mate. I wish you well. 12.55 is the time. Robert's in Greenwich. Robert, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Long-time listener. Um, yeah, I, th- I thought I'd had my bit after listening to Luke earlier, actually. Yeah. I, I, in the same position, I, I, was, I was quite young. And I was I, w- I was I was in drink. I had a couple of drinks, and we were out with friends. And a friend of mine was being assaulted. Right. Had, actually, the guy come over who was older than us. Yeah. I was nineteen or twenty. He was late thirties, I think. Quite a big chap, but then I was quite big. Um, yeah. And he was hitting a friend of mine, and he was dragging him across the road. I ran over and hit him once. Right. To kind of put him, you know, to get him to stop doing what he was doing, mm. and yeah, he ended up going to Crown Court. And to be honest with you, it was—I wasn't one of these people who I didn't believe should have gone to prison. Mm. Obviously, a lot of people say that. Yeah. Um, but going to the young offenders actually opened my eyes, and I think it was the make of me. I mean, at the time, I was no, fair enough. Business. I was—I was a young. Young guy running a business from a dad, and uh, I was doing quite well. Um, I've got a young family now. Yeah. And um, For the young offenders, I think the prison system because the people you see in there. How long, were, how long were you sentenced for? I got six months, ended up doing three. Um, but they sent me, like Luke, yeah. up to Ipswich. All and, over the uh, shop. All over the shop, yeah. Eventually, um, I ended up in a place called Holiday Bay, which is the young offenders. Right. But what I saw there and what they did in the, in the system there was, to me, a lot better. And I come out of there knowing full well, I mean, I'm in my 50s now. Right. There was no way I was ever going to re-offend. They gave me discipline. I mean, 
my, my family background, my grandfather was in the Navy, so right. quite a disciplined background from that side of the family. But were you on? Were you were you running wild? I mean, it doesn't sound as if you were running very wild before you went in. I wasn't. It, no. I, I was a typical 19-year-old yeah. who was out with his friends drinking, and if you see a situation and your friend's in trouble, unfortunately, and more so when you've had a couple of drinks... You're going to wade in. You tend to wade in. And I was six foot six and 18 stone. Oh. But I was a 19-year-old. Yeah. This guy was, you know, late 30s, early 40s. No, I don't, I don't, it, doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't sound as if you deserve to be no, sent down to but me. I, but, but you, in a sense, and I'm going to run out of time, but you're glad you were, all. I think. I'm glad I was. I okay. lost faith in the system because of what happened to me. But right. going into young offenders, marching, <laughs> working the way they work you. You liked the it. Discipline, not so much like you should have it, swapped it. with the last fella, shouldn't you? You should have gone in the army, <laughs> and he should yeah. have been running a business with your dad, and then neither of you would ever have gone to jail. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. Yeah, I, I'm grateful no for that. Anymore. It was a really interesting... God, what a bunch of stories that was. In fact, you know, I love it when you end the programme, and the last text that came into the studio says, please do this subject again, James. We'll put it on the list, shall we? We'll put it, we'll put it on the list. Um, that is it from me for another day. If you have missed any of today's show, then you can, of course, listen back to the whole show podcast on Global Player, where you can also pause and rewind live radio. You'll also find all of LBC shows to catch up on and all the latest news from LBC. It's brilliant, by the way, to, the, the ability to pause and rewind live radio on Global Player. It means you're always in control. And it's free from your app store or globalplayer.com. Tom Swarbrick with you at four. Sheila Fogarty with you now. Sheila Fogarty with with you now. Sheila Fogarty 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 with you now.